Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I hope uh, I am audible to everybody. And uh, first, I like to uh, say uh, very sorry, apologies for uh, this uh, late beginning of this webinar because of uh, some very uh, miserable technical problem in the IT department. Uh, but I hope that everybody is listening. I like to uh, invite. Uh, Mr. Kamran Hussain and Dr. Rafi to open their cameras so that we can uh, have a look at you and uh, your presence is confirmed. So, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dr. Samina. Good afternoon. I'm extremely sorry, sir, that uh, for this uh, problem that has actually occurred in the IT department. I don't know, something have went wrong and uh, uh, this is very delayed <coughs> webinar that I'm holding here. So, first of all, I like to thank our esteemed guest speakers and attendees, those who are present here, mostly they are all uh, students uh, for their participation in this webinar, uh, which is first in the series of uh, webinars on the broad theme of sustainable development, specifically environment and climate change. Uh, the topic of the webinar, as you all know, uh, it's quite relevant and important. That is net zero economy. Where does Pakistan stand? So first I'd like to introduce our esteemed guest speakers, uh, starting from Dr. Anil Salman. Uh, I don't see him in the list of uh, people who are here, but I think he will join us soon. Uh, Dr. Anil Salman's uh, introduction is a very, uh, very active, very famous person, and he has done a lot of work in this, in this uh, field of environment and climate change. Uh, but his proper introduction is like this: that he is the in charge of business management, MBA program, Department of Management Sciences, Comsat Institute of Information Technology in Islamabad. Dr. Salman's responsibilities include development of innovative and diverse business management, which is MBA programs and its stream, and he leads the implementation of the policy on MBA program within the faculty and deal with associated uh, yes, I mean. he, he is also an advisor on the postgraduate admission procedures and help the students to access appropriate funding opportunities and advise the staff with the postgraduate student's role within the faculty and lies with the quality assurance teams and support implementation of the recommendations relating to the MBA program. Dr. Neil Salman is the assistant professor of the Department of Management Sciences, COMSEX, that is Institute of Information Technology uh, in Islamabad, and he is working as the core member and resource person for COMSEX Center for Executive Development, creating generic and specialized training modules and conducting a specialized corporate leadership and management workshops. And he is also in, involved in the fundraising and uh, he has been the conference co-chair for many conferences. He is also involved in planning and vision building, research work, economic analysis, capacity building, training and policy analysis, qualifications. His qualification actually is a uh, he has done, uh, he has got the degree in economics, he is basically an economist, and uh, his focus of work, mostly the interest of uh, area of interest is behavioral economics, climate change, energy and development. He is also, uh, has worked as a strategy and leadership institutional governance, blue and green diplomacy, international trade and public policy. So Dr. Salman is a recipient of NCCR postdoctoral fellowship from uh, for Switzerland, Fulbright and ACSS scholarship from USA, and Presidential Talent Scholarship from Pakistan. Other areas of expertise include proposal development, project monitoring and evaluation, as well as project report writing. His uh, academic <coughs> work includes the uh, like South Asian uh, annual South Asian international conferences. He, is, he was the lead organizer and trainer of Pakistan's first impact 2015 CIIT and CIMB. He has got a lot of, uh, I mean, he's the 
winner of uh, many awards in teaching, mentoring, research and thesis supervision, major courses taught in economics and strategy, globalization and political uh, economy. He is the course director of Foreign Services Academy, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Government of Pakistan, Islamabad, adjunct faculty of the Government and Public Policy Department, Faculty of Contemporary Sciences, National Defense University in Islamabad. He is the course instructor of Pakistan Institute of Trade and Development, Ministry of Commerce and Trade and the Government of Pakistan. Also a visiting faculty of the School of Public Policy, uh, in the PAIT, Pakistan Institute of Development Economics in Islamabad, in the Performance Management, Staff Development and Performance Review, Induction, Succession Planning, all these activities is involving. Dr. Salman is the recipient of several national and international grants and and, the, and author of uh, various research papers. So this is the introduction of uh, our esteemed honorable guest speaker. Uh, and I like to, since Dr. Salman is here, he has joined us, I'd like to congratulate you, Dr. Salman. Uh, you are the recipient of IEA, Xinghua, uh, Xinghua about Chinese word, and into 2021, a collaborative human factors and agronomics education. The award is given by the International Economics Association, IEA, for Dr. Selman's significant and outstanding contributions to the success of postgraduate MEM program at the Xinhua University, China, which had HFE courses in the curriculum that focused on international and interregional collaboration. Congratulations and welcome to this webinar, uh, Dr. Neil Salman, I'm sorry for this late start of uh, this webinar because of the technical problem. And uh, I'm sorry I couldn't help it, but uh, that is what his life is all about. So the next speaker is uh, Dr. Mohammad Rafi. And uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Mohammad Rafi. He is an associate professor of economics at IM Sciences uh, in Peshawar. Dr. Rafiq has earned a PhD in economics with a special focus on environmental and resource economics. He holds more than 20 years of uh, diverse academic research consultancy, advocacy, and administrative experience. Besides his teaching and administrative work, he has also worked with different government departments, WWF Pakistan and SANDI, ICIMOD, TAF, WHO, UNICEF, UNDP, World Bank, and HEC, as a consultant and researcher. Uh, besides these, Dr. Rafir has worked as a trainer on climate change for FNF, Pakistan, and other organizations that he has conducted several trainings related to the different aspects of environment, natural resources, and climate change. Uh, Dr. Rafir has published several academic papers on valuation of environment along with natural resource economics and climate change. He has designed a payment for ecosystem services scheme for cotton grower in Sin. He has embarked on the several HEC funded environmental economics projects. Dr. Rafiq's academic engagement includes PhD studies on climate change, coupled with agriculture market competitiveness and valuation of Watson in Peshawar. Additionally, he is working on several assignments related to climate change that include UNDP sponsored National Gender Inclusive Roadmap for Green Jobs, which has been undertaken in consultation with the Ministry of Climate Change and WWF, a sponsored project developing environmental and social management framework and other safeguard documents for the WWF, GCF, Recharge Pakistan project. Furthermore, he is a co-PI, uh, co-principal investigator of LS. LCF project on SDG 6 and climate change and uh, a co-principal investigator of RASA project on ecosystem valuation of River Kabul in the wake of climate change. Dr. Rafi has been an activist of green movement throughout and he is actively participating in several environmental societies. Currently, Dr. Rafi is a member of Kishar Clean Air Alliance, which is working uh, closely with the government to improve the air quality of Peshawar. He is also a member of the Green Youth Movement Club of Iron Sciences, established by HEC 
and NOCC Government of Pakistan. He has also remained academic head, program coordinator of several academic programs at Alan Sciences from 2004 till 2017. Dr. Rafi has introduced curriculum related to environmental economics and climate change at the BS <coughs> and PhD levels at the Institute. Very impressive profile of Dr. Rafi. I'm glad that he is here. Very thankful to the speaker. Mr. Kamran Hussain, uh, thank you so much for being here with us, Dr. Saab, and you've been waiting for a long time, but I'm sorry I couldn't help it. This is a technical problem that happens in Pakistan, off and on. <clears throat> Mr. Hussain is a graduate in forestry discipline and did master's in mountain conservation and watershed management. He also possesses master's degree in development planning and management with research on REDD plus safeguards. REDD is uh, uh, basically uh, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. Dr. Hussain, Mr. Hussain is also a certified terrestrial carbon accountant from University of California, San Diego, USA. He also uh, certified as in carbon forestry from University of Fiber, Germany. Currently, Kamran uh, Saab is working on international REDD as a strategy export with Helvetas, Swiss inter uh, rotation, and leading the provincial REDD plus action plan for Pakistan. He has worked as international forestry consultant with UN FAO in Sudan to perform capacity based need assessment for national MMRV and AFOLU, agriculture, forestry, and other land use sector, and development national action plan for Sudan's national forest monetary system. Earlier, he worked in different relevant international positions, which include technical expert, data analyst, um, with Arbonaut, Finland, National Forest Inventory Export, with Federal Ministry of Climate Change in Pakistan, he is a national consultant for REDD plus MMRV Pakistan and the joint venture of UN and REDD Bangkok and WWF in Pakistan. Mr. Sain has authored several research publications and important documents at the national level important, including Pakistan's REDD. So the, thank you so much, <coughs> all the esteemed speakers, guests, guest speakers here in this webinar. Uh, with your permission, uh, the honorable guest speakers, and uh, with the, stand, the attendees here, uh, I'd like to set the ball rolling with brief remarks on the topic of uh, uh, this webinar, that the net zero economy, where does Pakistan stand? So what is actually the net zero economy? Uh, net zero economy is that economy which has the balance <coughs> between the amount of greenhouse gas produces, produced and the amount removed from the atmosphere. So we reach net zero uh, when the amount we add is no more than the amount taken away. I think UK became the first uh, world major economy to set a target of uh, being net zero by 2050. So net zero is basically the same as uh, the carbon neutral. I mean, emissions are still being generated, but they are offset by the same amount elsewhere. So the net total of emissions is then zero. But the confusion here is that sometimes net zero is used to talk about uh, all the greenhouse gases. <clears throat> and sometimes it is you. I was talking about what the net zero economy is. I think COVID-19 pandemic and climate change, they have exposed the systemic vulnerabilities of our uh, economies and societies. So as we tackle both threats concurrently, now is the moment to take <coughs> deliberate, concerted and the timely action to build a cleaner, greener, fairer, healthier and more resilient global society. So we have less than <coughs> a decade to have global emissions and put us on a net zero by mid-century trajectory. 
I think most national and international <coughs> are aiming net zero by either 2030 or 2050. So to reach it, emissions <coughs> must be reduced. But offsetting and sequestering uh, emissions are necessary to reach the goals. <coughs> the IPCC, the famous IPCC, in their recent report, they have issued a code red. And that is more than a 50% chance that we will reach 1.5 yes, Celsius uh, warming within the next two decades if emissions continue at their current level and the current rate. So while many countries have strengthened their commitments, it is clear that the ambition is nowhere near enough to keep the global warming to uh, 2 degrees Celsius. So let alone the 1.5 degrees Celsius. So it is uh, in this context that this year's uh, Net Zero Economy Index, <coughs> it examines the rate of decarbonization needed to deliver a 1.5 degree Celsius. This is aligned to Net Zero World by 2050 and examines how G20 member states are uh, faring against uh, what is required. At 12.9% annual global rate of decarbonization is now required to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And in 2020, the rate of global decarbonization, the reduction in carbon intensity or related energy carbon dioxide emissions per dollar of GDP was 2.5%. So this rate represents a very slight improvement from last year's a uh, rate of 2.5 percent, but uh, it is still significantly lower than the annual growth global rate of uh, decarbonization required to achieve the 1.5 degree Celsius goal. So keeping warming to 1.6, 1.5 degree Celsius, it will now require the average global rate of decarbonization over five times greater than what was seen in 2020. So with the impact of uh, uh, COVID-19, if it is continues, uh, it is felt across the world. So many countries are beginning to lift uh, restrictions, as we know, it's very commonly uh, common observation. But with it, we are seeing a resurgence and the economic activity and uh, rebound in the emissions. Uh, the growth in emissions during 2021, it has been driven by an increase in the demand for coal and electricity generation. So despite efforts by these by some governments to stimulate a green recovery, global energy demand is set to increase by 4.6% in 2022. It's led largely by the emerging markets and uh, the developing economies. So uh, keeping all this uh, data in mind, uh, the recent uh, information that is that the Net Zero Economy Index, uh, which has been published by the PwC, uh, it has provided and it actually provides a very outstanding corporate finance accounting services like audit and tax analysis, business compliances and corporate finance, etc. So. <coughs> Uh, it tracks the rate of decarbonization of the G20 countries across uh, energy-related carbon dioxide emissions. So within the G20 countries, the Mexico and Indonesia, they recorded the highest rates of emissions reduction relative to their economic growth. So across these countries, energy-related emissions fell by 12.4% and 10.6% respectively in uh, uh, 2019 levels. So largely due to economic restrictions and response to the pandemic. So these results are expected to be an isolated occurrence other than the evidence of a long-term trend as each country has actually announced plans to invest in fossil fuel production in 2021. So none of the G20 member states achieved the 12.9 rate of uh, decarbonization. It is now required to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Now, a million dollar question is, where does Pakistan stand? And our guest speakers, honorable speakers, they are uh, actually 
uh, experts in this area uh, of uh, net zero economy issues. So I would like to invite first Dr. Anil Salman. Uh, uh, over to you, Dr. Salman. Madam, thank you very much for the kind invitation. And uh, it is always a privilege to always uh, speak at AERC. Uh, and uh, I'll be just uh, giving my views like we just had this COP26 last year that where does Pakistan stand and what is the way forward? Because one thing is for sure that climate change is real. No matter what climate skeptics say, what kind of research comes up. But we have to be uh, positive about it that climate change is real. It is affecting Pakistan. And we have a choice of uh, adaptation, mitigation, loss and damage. But what is the best route that we yet uh, that we have yet to decide? We have our updated uh, national climate change policy over here. Uh, another intervention is that now we have a climate change policy act, and in this act, like if there is any uh, violation, there are penalties. But in this COP26, they have introduced this terminology of uh, net zero uh, emissions. So where do we stand and do we have the capacity? What is the government talking about? What the civil society talks about? This is what we have to understand. Now, I will uh, share uh, my slides over here. And G so, your camera is not on. I mean, I can't see you here. Sure, madam. I can see myself. Yeah, I can yeah. see. I can see the top. Yeah. Okay. Maybe something. Uh, with my computer, I don't know. Okay, please. Uh, is my screen visible? Uh, yes, the... yes. Yeah, you okay. can see. Okay. So uh, talking about uh, net zero economy and where does Pakistan stand, I'll basically just uh, a quick review about COP, that it is very important. It is a decision making body of uh, United Nations framework on climate change convention. And the scope is basically the implementation of the convention and any other legal instruments that COP adopts to take decisions necessary to promote the effective implementation of the convention. And uh, we gather every year. Uh, so far, there are 197 countries uh, included in it. And mostly the outcomes are the declaration, the agreement. Uh, I'm referring it to the Paris Agreement and the pact. And this time we had the Glasgow Pact. So Paris Agreement has a very crucial importance. And from there, we connect it with the COP26. That was the uh, Glasgow one. So the negotiating groups in uh, COP is these are all the negotiating groups. And Pakistan is also uh, an active participant in one of these groups. Now. What we have done in the COP21 was that there was an NDC, Nationally Determined Contribution. And these were the non-binding national plans, which actually uh, brought in black and white, talked about that how, what would be the climate targets and how countries are going to reduce these emissions. And they are going to uh, implement it since Paris Agreement and now when we came to COP26 in Glasgow, we were reviewing it that how many targets were achieved or not. Uh, Dr. Samina has already uh, developed the base when she highlighted where what has been the role of G8 countries 
and how developing countries have been participating into it. Then this terminology in this uh, in the last uh, stretch of 2021 comes out that is net zero emission. And if you can see a lot of uh, international organizations, particularly uh, McKinsey has done a remarkable work in terms of that how the corporate sector or how the private sector can make a impact or what kind of interventions they have to do to bring their emissions to net zero and what UNFCCC defines uh, net zero emissions as all man-made greenhouse gas emissions must be removed from the atmosphere through reduction measures thus reducing the earth's net climate balance and that is how they look at it that okay these are the man-made greenhouse gas emissions. In 2015, we had a big fanfare. Even our head of state went over there and we had this uh, Paris Climate Agreement. And these were the six points that we talked or that we agreed upon uh, the, this 31-pages uh, document that was the Cli Paris Climate Agreement. One thing I would like to uh, like just mention which usually in most of my uh, climate discussions it confuses most of the students is that Paris Agreement and Kyoto Protocol are the same. No, they are not. They are completely different. Kyoto Protocol has a different agenda and Paris Agreement was completely different. And the six major key points that came or that were agreed in the Paris Agreement was that we have to keep the global temperature increase below two degrees centigrade and try to pursue it, uh, pursue it towards 1.5 degrees centigrade. And 186 countries submitted their plans. Pakistan was also one of it. And on a lighter note, yes, in uh, when we submitted our NDC, there was a lot of uh, discussion that on the quality of the NDC that, uh, well, we do not have the accepted quality the way other developing countries have submitted their NDC. The reason from the government came was that uh, we have recently uh, uh, became uh, part of this uh, CPEC and still those emissions, the anticipated emissions are yet to be calculated. That's where we have uh, a very concise kind of NDC. So, but later on the next year, when we uh, met in Poland, uh, the document was very much comprehensive, which is very much available on the UNFCCC website. So, overall assessment of how countries are going to cut their emissions and uh, they have to make their NAPAs and LAPAs, and after every five years, they are going to review it. There was a huge amount of money that was uh, set for the developing countries and uh, that was around 100 billion US dollars. And the rich countries were supposed to engage in absolute reduction of uh, these emissions and uh, the developing ones would be working on the mitigation and the adaptive mechanisms. Now, uh, the last key point which talked about this Paris Agreement was that countries should reach climate uh, global peaking of greenhouse gases as soon as possible. So this was what was agreed in 2015 in Paris Agreement. So what happened now when we look at in 2015, last year we couldn't have the COP. Uh, it was basically because of the pandemic. But this year, now it was the re review time, and now we look at that how countries have responded to that agreement that they, that they made in Paris. Now, the first one was that uh, actually, the since 2018, the oceanic heating has increased. It has been the highest on record. The sea levels increased five millimeter. The frequency of the natural disasters we actually see an increased number. The developing countries, if you look at the costs that who were the most affected one, those were the developing countries. And the last, which was very important from the perspective of developing countries, that was 
that it was pledged that uh, they were supposed to give us 100 billion but so far it had just reached to 279 so still 20 billion was missing and the commitment that was made by the developed countries they couldn't fulfill it now come on to we move on to uh, cop 26 happening in glasgow uh, very big aspirations uh, and again commitments so why cop 26 is special the major takeaway that was uh, given by the end of the cop 26 was that they were optimistic the optimism was there that we are still keeping the 1.5 degree centigrade alive that okay the countries are going to work towards that goal and it was technically it there were six years as i already told you that uh, we couldn't have the COP last year, uh, like I'm talking about 2020, but it marks the first five year interval. And as I already shared in the previous slide that we had the five year time and after five years, we are going to review that how this uh, performance after Paris Agreement, how countries have responded towards climate change adaptation or mitigation. So it was basically the deadline and Glasgow uh, came up as a platform to show our uh, result that how we have performed in terms of our climate interventions, in terms of our climate ambitions that we made promises in 2015. Now, what were the basic important agendas that came in uh, COP26? That was number one, that they were ensuring the commitments of major carbon emitting countries to limit carbon emissions to keep the global warming below 1.5 and still china is the biggest emitter in uh, climate change emissions number two they also talked about as i shared the previous slide that okay the uh, financial commitment was not fulfilled so they also said in the uh, at glasgow that the scaling up of climate fund to support the vulnerable countries and you need to fulfill the 100 uh, billion US dollar pledge package. The third point that came out of this COP26 was that we need to have a bigger share of climate fund towards adaptation. And to this day, we still have this uh, debate that, OK, should developing countries be going towards mitigation or adaptation? And uh, the true answer is both efforts are important, but Pakistan being a very has very uh, less emissions in terms of the uh, major contributors. So adaptation seems to be a plausible equation that seemed working. And then they also talked about we need to finalize our rule book, a Paris rule book to ensure that there is transparency and accountability. And the last one, which came in one of the cops that, OK, you need to establish the mechanism for uh, loss and damage. So these were the major important agenda points that came up in Glasgow. Now, uh, what the uh, the head of the UNFCC said that humanity's last best chance for limiting the global temperature increase to 1.5 C. Now, what has actually happened, and this is what uh, BBC talks about, that we still need to have a very large emissions. And that's what uh, Nicholas Stern has been talking about. And other economists like Partha Das Gupta, they have been saying that we need to still make a huge sacrifice in the present time. And what were the pledges before COP26? That was around 52.4 gigatons. Pledges at COP26, the ones that we have made, it takes us around 42 uh, gigaton. But in order to maintain that 1.5, you need to reduce it to 26.6 gigaton, which is um, uh, more uh, like 50% of what the countries have pledged at the moment. So this is a question to ponder for both developed and developing countries that what kind of uh, specific and I would bring the word intense interventions are to be made to in order to fulfill that pledge that, OK, we will be reaching at 1.5 by 2030. So still the 
these pledges needs to be revised. So this is what I've already talked about the agenda points, but this is what the pact looks like that phase out the unabated coal power and inefficient subsidies for fossil fuels. Now I am just, uh, I will just focus on the token. Keep in mind Pakistan and look at CPAC. We are getting all the money, most of the money for the energy projects in terms of coal. But uh, what they say that we have to phase out the coal power. Number two, what they say is that you need to revisit and strengthen 2030 climate targets. As I said, that you need to revise your NDCs because uh, what we have pledged, it still doesn't take us to the required target. Then developed countries need to uh, are urged to do at least double collective provision of climate finance. They said that, okay, it needs to go beyond the 100 uh, billion US dollar. And the last one is recognizing the need to for support towards a just transition. So we need to move from the traditional uh, production mechanisms to the modern one, bringing green architecture, green production and all that sort of technologies. And as COP26 rolled up and uh, there were optimists, but if you see the other side, the media thought that, OK, this was just like another COP. It was failed and they termed that COP26 actually failed. It was just some promises that countries made uh, just to support the event. But in reality, if we do the reality check, not much has been done. And even now, what the uh, these uh, John Let's say that, the, that COP27 might be a few times. Now, coming on to COP26 and Pakistan, it's encouraging that we have children also with us in this session. So, uh, COP26 in Pakistan, let's see what we have. The net zero targets. Like most countries that have pledged net zero targets have yet to put forward their implementation plans. And you will be amazed at some of the countries which are the large emitters. So uh, their 2030 targets do not always suggest a near term transformative action. So that is a classical problem that we usually get in these. Uh, so. Uh, अब जो pledge हमने किए हुए net zero targets they are उसकी जो timeline है वो इतनी ज़्यादा है and we do not have the implementation plan so we do not see कि जो countries ने target किया for example they are saying कि 2070 तक we will go for these net zero targets which doesn't seem practical कि the deadline is 2030 so we need to revise these net zero targets and the pace by which these countries are trying to uh, make these emissions stop that has to be a very intense plan. that Pakistan has not committed to any long term net zero. And uh, but what they have done is it has done a 50 percent reduction in its emissions by 2030 or 15 percent is unconditional. That is important. Now there are certain positivities if we are trying to go for the net zero Yes, it is an opportunity. We need to phase down our uh, coal. But if you look at the balance of trade, dekhte hai, uske andar we are still importing a quite a number of uh, or, or coal from outside. And we need to have a financial plan, a concessional finance for phasing out the coal. So that is what Pakistan needs to do. If okay, we are serious in terms of reducing our net uh, and reducing our carbon emissions, we need to phase out coal from our business models. Then a uh, very interesting uh, accomplishment in Glasgow that was the finalization of Article 6 in the Paris Agreement. And this was the much awaited carbon markets. And uh, I think uh, the third speaker, he would be more uh, like uh, having more knowledge. Uh, to my knowledge, I think Abhi, there are just 34 CDMs in comparison to other South Asian countries. It is very less. So we need 
to have better uh, designed projects where we can uh, like where we can showcase these projects for the carbon trading and it is definitely a market mechanism where pakistan can benefit out of it ek isi ke andar i would add up that uh, red ki uh, baat ho rahi thi reducing emissions uh, from deforestation and forest degradation uh, that is also an excellent opportunity given that we have this uh, 100 billion tsunami tree project so we can earn out of it and lessons learned is from nepal which are wahan pe jo communities hain they are applying this red plus initiative and they are earning money out of it ek aur jo pakistan uh, jisme uh, we are not that efficient as compared to other countries that is our access to the international finance and this is my personal uh, which is kehte hain experience that most of the times when the projects are being sent they are confused with development projects we got these terms like climate compatible development or all that but somehow pakistan has not uh, been able to uh, access the international finance pehli baat ke we do not have a direct access to the concessional climate finance aur dusri baat ye hai that even if we have it we do not we it, we are unable to spend or absorb these finances from different other names so uh we need to uh, like uh, come up with innovative projects we need to uh, send them as many as we can aur ek aur baat hai these are competitive grants they are not based on ki if we are coming on in the ranking ki we are very vulnerable nation so we are going to get this climate finance no it's not we have to compete with other countries for the global climate finance so the project writing and the way organizations are working they have to come up with some certain very tangible kind of climate interventions and then we are able to compete in for this international finance as i already talked about that ndc ki jo abhi jo hamare paas uh, commitments hain they do not lead to this 20 30 reduction of 1.5 we need to revise it and it's a good opportunity where pakistan can also revise its ndc and develop a proper business plan with a true budget and the timeline uh uske baad uh, apart from this uh, carbon ek aur jo cheez iske andar glasgow ke andar aayi that was ke pakistan became the signatory of global methane pledge to limit methane emissions by 30% compared with the 2020 levels so that is also it's not ke greenhouse gas ke andar uh, just some periodic table mein dekhte hain ki it's only carbon no there is water vapors also there is sulfur there is nitrogen and this is methane also so that is also a positive step for the decarbonization of the economy lekin maze ki baat that once we went to cop uh, cop 26 our minister um, malik amin aslam said that we don't believe in net zero at the moment aur phir unhone apni ek wo wish list wish list kya apni ek prescription rather unhone kaha ki these are the interventions that we are making with reference to climate change but at the moment we are pakistan is not ready for net zero and his words were that this has been the decade of disappointment and now we are making a transition towards the decade of action or decade of action kya tha these are the steps that pakistan ka ye directional step hai at the moment or number one hai that we are going to have 60% zero carbon then you clean energy by 2030 and we are going 30% electric by 2030 this announcement was done by uh, our prime minister imran khan at the world economic forum also so hamari uh, uh, nayi wo electric policy bhi aa gayi hai we have our new uh, updated uh, alternative energy uh, ki policy bhi hai we have our water policy updated climate policy so we have excellent policies and maze ki baat like last uh, month we had the national Econo- uh, national security policy which has six components in which environment is also one of them the non traditional threat so uh, our policies are very much uh, sensitizing these issues of environment and looking at the present government i think this is the only one which brought environment 
as one of the premier agendas to talk about and to sensitize people that okay environment matters for number two intervention apart from the clean energy they are doing is that we are having this 10 billion tree tsunami uske andar uh, ek aspect hai, uh, there are there's a research by economists that you need to see what kind of trees you are planting jahan pe water scarce hai aap wahan pe water intense uh, species aap nahi laga sakte so that kind of studies are still to be needed then uh, 15 new national parks have been declared in 2021 and what the uh, another initiative is that you have to recharge pakistan using the flood waters for restoring our wetlands and managing and adapting to climate change so adaptation is one of the focus of the present uh, government. So, uh, the McKinsey has done a little bit work on Pakistan and what this is that net zero and environment, social and governance strategy. And they say that you need to rewrite the climate mathematics equation. And what would that be? Yes, go with team. Sectors may take ten teen angles that net zero commitments are rising. As we say every day, companies are at the micro level, at the macro level, they are giving these commitments, but the net zero equation is not solved. Yes, you have given us the the uh, what to be done, but the how part is still missing. And this can only change if nine interdependent requirements are met with singular resolve un unity and ingenuity about nine elements hai, just ki wajah se koi developing countries and even though developed countries can reach net zero these are three major blocks in the rata the first one is the physical building block the second one is economic and social adjustment and the third one is governance so in the physical building block where we absolutely in pakistan need technological innovation we need to have an ability to create uh, better supply chains. Or my supply chains are uh, abhi itni efficient nahi. We need to have better value chains, which is supported by our infrastructure and the availability of the necessary natural resources. Number two, jo aata hai, that is basically the economic and the societal adjustments, which includes the capital relocation and the financing structures. Then we need to see that how given the CPEC projects that how the demand shifts and how the cost structures are going to change and the last one ke jaha pe aap interventions karte unke compensating mechanisms kya honge. The last the three parts are basically the governance uh, thing ke we need to come up with the governance standards we have to develop the effective institutions and market mechanisms and my uh, I'm pointing towards the carbon markets. Carbon markets need to be strengthened for Pakistan. And uh, it, has, it has to come up with the commitment and collaboration. Uh, public sector kuch bhi kar le, without the cooperation and collaboration from private sector, we, are, we cannot do much. So the private sector needs to be involved in it. And the last but not the least, there has to be support from citizens and consumers it has to be empowered to them so uh, the, these are the most of the takeaways or my uh, inputs in terms of the how we can uh, work on uh, our uh, commitments towards the net zero and uh, what has been pakistan's stance ke abhi hum net zero ki taraf nahi ja rahe, but these are the uh, these are this is the wish list that we have provided in the Glasgow Pact. Uh, thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Saad. Um, I think you have really illuminated us and your presentation was uh, completely thrilling <laughs> because it's so much information that you have shared with us. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I'd like to just to make a comment on your presentation Madam. because it was very comprehensive and uh, I mean very informative, the facts and figures that you have given. But uh, as you know that government uh, has a very pivotal role to play in creating the enabling environment for the transition to net zero through policies and uh, regulatory 
and investment too. But why did the minister said that uh, we don't believe in net zero uh, economy? I mean, what made him think like this and say it at a international platform that we don't? I mean, I need to know what is going on in his mind. He must have shared his uh, uh, his views, and he must have given some some kind of comment on it. So, if you have uh, the chance to talk to him, uh, then what is actually going on? Ma uh, Madam, I couldn't uh, had an opportunity to uh, talk to him, but. Uh, the bigger apprehension is from from the developing countries that they have to give up a lot of present consumption. And given that Pakistan is with it, uh, the way it is progressing, having uh, GDP rebasing, we have done the GDP growth rate. Hum, uh, where we were going negative in few year uh, uh, during COVID, now we are reaching towards four to five percent. I think not to compromise the present economic growth rate. Maybe that's why this kind of statement came that, okay, we do not believe in net zero and we will be doing these 50 percent carbon emissions in which 15 percent is unconditioned. But what about investment in technology, new technology, uh, environment and new technology? I mean, are they not willing to make any commitment on the investment side uh, or okay. have they asked? Any uh, private sector to do it for them? Uh, in the uh, with reference to W, uh, I'll uh, move on to WTO. Wahan pe they have uh, brought these solar panels, wind powers. In Kohinoor, they have uh, termed it as EGs, environmental goods. Or uske okay. under they have reduced the duties. The government is encouraging. Just as I told you, that our uh, electric uh, vehicle policy, EV policy, bhi aagi hai. But uh, okay. given that the the pace of that kind of transition is slow. And whenever we are going to make this transi uh, transition, obviously it is going to have high costs. Whether the country is ready or not, that is a, a question. Yeah, you are right, absolutely. Okay, thank you so much. If, uh... Thank you so much. Uh, I will just make a small note. I have another meeting scheduled, so I'll be just uh, really? leaving, but it was pleasure. Uh, over here. Uh, I'm, Dr. Rafiq, I'm so uh, sorry I have to keep you waiting. Extremely sorry no, no. for that. No worries, uh, ma'am. That's what technology is. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much once Thank again. So Rafiq, I, 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 hope, I hope to see you uh, more often on our webinars. Inshallah, ma'am. Dr. Rafiq, uh, best of luck. I'm sorry, I would have loved to hear your presentation. But my uh -huh. scheduled meeting, thi, otherwise I would have loved to be part of your thing. Uh -huh. oh, no, thank we you. Probably. Excellent presentation. Thank you. This okay. very so thank the, you. Uh, next uh, guest speaker, the honorable guest speaker is uh, Dr. Mohammed Rafiqa. So are you there, sir? I mean, I can't see you on my screen, but I hope that your camera is on. And... Uh, 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 am I audible and is my screen visible? Yeah, audible, yes, definitely. And my screen is visible. The screen is uh, blank for me here. I don't know about others if the other people are. IT department, what is happening? Have you? I think your screen is yes now. On. Yeah, I can see the your screen. presentation. Yes, yes, slide, slides are on. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sabina. Uh, thank you so much, um, ARC, yeah. for, uh, gee, for having me. Okay. Um, okay um, Dr. Sabina, you put the stage very directly by, uh, you know, discussing the overall uh, climate scenario, and I would also appreciate the uh, presentation made by. Dr. Neil Salman, and uh, just giving us the overarching overview. Um, the point where I'm going to pick up is, uh, you know, some some intervention at the at the local level that we can do to achieve the net zero economy. Um, we all know that the uh, the net zero economy has just been described, uh, so I don't have to really define it. The good news is that uh, you know recently. Recently, uh, we have been um, 
we become the first regional coalition uh, for the net zero uh, yes for, for the net zero alliance which is a national collaboration between uh, the 22 pioneering companies uh, the public institutions and the the, the sectoral uh, ex experts ex you know. so uh, the goal is that by by 2050 we'll have this uh, net zero and uh, the aim is to mobilize one billion dollars of catalytic finance for decarbonizing uh, nurturing a good environment for effective climate policy action and enable companies to demonstrate sustainability uh, sustainability credential to global buyers so that's the good news but <clears throat> what is the present situation uh, though Adil Salman has uh, Dr. Saab has described this very eloquently but you know just just going through these statistics if you look at the climate change uh, which is being observed in Pakistan from 1900 to 2000 and uh, according to the meteorological data the temperature has risen by 0 0.05 celsius per decade in pakistan um, just if we talk about the province of balochistan the temperature has risen by 1.15 uh, celsius and in punjab by 0.56 um, and in sin is 0.44 centigrade these are official statistics uh, but the northern areas, they have witnessed a higher temperature increase than the southern areas, resulting in glacial med loud, increasing the risk of flooding and situation and the siltation of dams. Uh, the heat waves have been an annual occurrence over the last decade. Uh, and the you know if we look at that, despite achieving the uh, certain uh, certain milestones towards the SDG 13. Pakistan still ranks fifth in the countries that are most vulnerable to climate change. On the top of that, the COVID pandemic has also um, importantly, uh, you know, set limitations on our uh, ability to achieve those goals. And it's, it has special implications for the gender dimensions and the uh, which are previously uh, disadvantaged uh, towards the uh, gender equality in the, in the country. So that's the another uh, dimension towards it. So as uh, per my understanding, the way forward, uh, the way forward is that we have to opt for uh, green growth and green economy, not only as a, as a commitment to the to the uh, global accord that has been reached, but uh, for our own sustainability, we have to have this green growth and green economy in, in our country. Um, this is generally understood, but I would define, uh, as the United Nations has put it uh, rightly, that green economy is actually a low carbon, resource efficient and socially inclusive uh, economy, which is coupled with environmental, social uh, and uh, the governance aspect. You know. So all this is about uh, the innovation. Um, this is about the change that come across all the sectors. Uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, Doctor. Slides are not moving. I think we're stuck on the first uh, title slide. We've got 18 slides there, but uh, we can't see it. And the social outcomes, which are equitable distribution of resources. So all this is encompass uh, and it is called as green growth and green economy now what we have done uh, to get this green growth uh, economy if we, you know dr anil salman has also explained but you know I, i'll just also highlight some of the green growth initiatives in pakistan um, the case studies are uh, not here but if you just look at the the, the green growth initiative in last few years so the one has been green, clean and green Pakistan, uh, which is about also recharging Pakistan and you know uh, the from the flood water and recharging through the wetlands etc. Then we have now the 10 billion tree tsunami program. Uh, we have this uh, GLUF, uh, the Glacial Lake Outburst Flood program, the Sustainable Forest Management, Pakistan Snow Leopard and Ecosystem Production Program. And national ozone units, uh, climate resilient urban human settlement unit, establishment of WASH strategic planning and coordination cell, ecosystem restoration initiatives, 
capacity building on water quality and SDG 6 and national electric vehicle policy. These are some of the uh, initiatives which I just have highlighted it here. There, there are many. Uh, so uh, the picture you are seeing right now are the NDCs, which Dr. Uh, uh, Neil Salman talked about. Uh, its major thing is the uh, the mitigation, which is renewable conversion towards the renewable energy. Mm -hmm. OK, right. Uh, is this visible now? Is it visible now? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Now it's here. Yes. OK, thank you so much. Uh, please carry on. I'm sorry for the inconvenience, but uh, these are technology blues, I guess. Um, yeah, no, no problem, sir. Thank you. Right, so I just I just was pointing out some of the initiatives that has been taken by government of Pakistan, and uh, I just talked about it, which are on the slide right now. Um, the clean green Pakistan, the 10 billion tree tsunami, and and the rest of the programs uh, which are there. But uh, what's the problem? The uh, the problem is th th these are the NDCs uh, which I was just uh, highlighting. That a major thing here is the conversion toward the renewable energy uh, uh, by an amount of 60 percent till 2030. That was announced by government of Pakistan. Uh, the prime minister himself announced and a conversion towards electric vehicles by 30 percent. Uh, similarly, we just uh, talked about the uh, recharge Pakistan, which is the on the very right corner. It's, it's about the adaptation. Uh, and it's about the Indus Basin, the flood risk uh, mitigation, enhanced water recharge, uh, and the enhancing the protected areas from 12% to 15%. And the 10 billion uh, tsunami, the tree tsunami that we talked about. So, so these are the uh, NDCs, the nationally declared uh, commitments uh, uh, by the government of Pakistan and updated on this. The problem is, <clears throat> that there are some challenges uh, that we are facing and since all our effort we are unable to put it together is because uh, of some of the challenges that we are facing and these challenges are that um, we in the past we couldn't introduce the environmental taxation um, on the quantity of pollution right if we look at all the provinces um, you know um, so in the all the provinces, the taxes are uh, not in accordance with the quantity. It's not the polluter pay principle that we are following. So I just won't go into that detail, but you know, since uh, all these are linked, so one of the major challenge or the problem is uh, the polluter isn't supposed to pay for what they are doing. Uh, <clears throat> similarly, there is a lack of green infrastructure. We haven't introduced new codes of uh, designing buildings which are environmental fr friendly. Um, also, if you look at the capacities of the provincial uh, governments and the provincial role, that's not adequate. Uh, the EPA, um, everywhere, the federal EPA, or the EPA in KP, or EPA in SIN, and they lack resources. For example, we don't have a single monitoring station in KP anywhere. You know, we just have some mobile monitoring stations to monitor the kind of emissions that we are doing. Uh, there, there are some private initiatives in Peshawar, but uh, not by government. I just spoke to additional secretary Forrest last night, and he just confirmed that we don't have a single stationary. Uh, what you say, the monitoring station in Peshawar, which is the capital. So just forget about the rest of the cities in KP. We do have some monitoring stations in Karachi and Lahore, but then, uh, you know, so w w how it is helping us, actually. Um, then for, you know, just overcoming some some environmental problems, or, uh, you know, the climate related problems. Dr. Sandeep, uh, Anil Salman also talked about the, the carbon market. So. But the, there's a huge market failure over here. We haven't introduced those, those markets. Um, for example, the Red Plus are, for example, the payment for ecosystem schemes and for you know other uh, market-based incentives, you know, uh, so which are introduced in the rest of the country. So these are some of the challenges. So though we have introduced a lot of a lot of programs, but 
you know, at the institutional level, at the, at the governance level, there are certain challenges which need it to be addressed. So these are some of the challenges I just uh, talked about. Um, so from here, where do we go then? Um, these are some additional challenges. Yes, I just talked about the governance failure. Um, I, I hope this is visible. Uh, the political leadership commitment uh, is, is a major, uh, though the PTI government has done a lot, but still, uh, if you look at there are some of other initiatives, um, uh, so they, they are not coinciding, in fact. Uh, similarly, uh, the, 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 now the, the punch line which I'm going to use from this point onward is the, is the last one. So it's it's not enough. Uh, it's the uh, the lack of know-how actually. It's the it's the human capital that we lack. Uh, it's a good green initiative. So what do we have to do? I I just quickly wind it up because you know I I had ended the commitment. So we'll just move on to what I I want to talk about is the uh, we have to opt for uh, an approach which is called as the green job and the green skill approach. So what is green jobs and the green skill approach? which is in continuation of what I was talking about. But, you know, as I said, at the, at the failure is we don't have the capital. Uh, so so there are three things which we need to put uh, to see what jobs are green. And those are which are uh, environmental services uh, and uh, which are providing minimizing the environmental impacts. These are green economy, green industries uh, also. Uh, but there's an element of decency of the job as well. And the third element is the gender aspect. So these are gender inclusive. These are decent jobs, which means the social protection and all the safety measures are provided. And they are also reducing the emissions and greening the processes in fact. So three things put together. So if we take the ILO example, the, the ILO defines the green jobs as having these three, three dimensions. Uh, so there is no consensus on what is called as green jobs. So these are not all together, you know, erecting new sector or new jobs. These are greening the processes, in fact. So I'll take a broader definition. But then, I, as I said, they, I'll, I'll put three three arrows to it. One, they are greening process. Number two, they are safer jobs. Number three, they are socially and gender inclusive as well. So, so that that is the key, you know. If we also look at the the human capital that we have in Pakistan, is there is 31 percent unemployment amongst the educated youth. So that is also going to solve the the unemployment problem as well. Besides tackling the climate change and the environmental uh, environmental problems. So, um. I'll just skip that. Uh, some of the you know sectors where we can have, uh, you know, green job doesn't mean creating new sectors. It means you know reforming our present system, present structures. So the primary sectors, if you look at, uh, I'll, I'll just talk about the sectors that we have. So we have the informal sectors and the formal sectors, and in within this formal and informal, we have the primary sectors. Uh, we are calling primary because. They are already green, for example, the agriculture and forestry are low carbon economy. So that's why we are calling it green. It, it, it uh, contributes 24% to the GDP uh, and um, the annual growth rate is 3.8%. 72% of Pakistan's foreign exchange comes from this sector. The formal employment is 37.4%. Uh, the 59% of all labels fall under the category of uh, vulnerable label. So uh, here, if we have to create, you know, uh, just reform our system, if we have to make certain commitments to the global accord, if we have to solve our unemployment problem, so here we have a sector where which needs interventions, which needs biotechnology interventions, which need AI interventions, which needs, uh, you know, uh, those crops which are drought resistant, requires less water. So which means we need new skills for the, this sector which means we need green jobs so so that's the that's the punch line which i'm putting when i'm putting it here now but most of the jobs will come from the secondary sector and that which means that the 80 percent of the jobs will be uh, in the manufacturing uh, the clothing furniture and all the industries that we have uh, so 
most of the job will come because all these are brown sectors. So, you know, just reforming that would mean, for example, putting waste water treatment plants, uh, just, you know, putting stakes um, high up, or, you know, the catalytic converters and all those scrubbers, etc., which means you need new, new, new sectors along with these traditional sectors. And for that, you need green skills. So, so that's the, uh, you know, one of the way to tackle the, the, uh, the climate change and reach the zero carbon emissions, for example. The tertiary sectors, they are the retail sectors and the financial services which are required. Uh, so, yes, so I'll just stop over here because I've been called for another uh, presentation. So uh, it was nice talking to you. Um, I will catch you some other time. I'm sorry for, you know, this uh, interruption, but then I've been called for another uh, interview, uh, sorry, for presentation. Uh, hopefully, I'll take your questions. You can email me and I would respond. Thank you so much. Bisli chali gayi thi, as usual, and it took some time to uh, use the generator. So, I'm sorry for that. I mean, I can't help it. I don't know what is happening. I think uh, Rafi Saab is uh, not there. He is left. Kamran Saab, are you there? Kamran Hussain? Oh, yes. Now we can see your uh, presentation. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Kamran Hussain. And uh, first of all, I'm really grateful to uh, you, Madam, um, for inviting me for this webinar. And uh, I'm also grateful to Dr. Uh, Anil Salman and uh, Dr. Rafi Kazul for the broader introduction and uh, your views. <clears throat> for me, uh, I will mostly talk about from the economic point of view. Um, but uh, to understand the status of Pakistan, where does Pakistan actually stand in terms of net zero economy? Uh, I think there are a few concepts that need to be understood very well uh, that I will discuss. So, first of all, if you can see, uh, I will not go into the details, I will just highlight a little bit more on what you have said earlier that what is the global context of the net zero economy. And uh, then the current emission trends at the global level uh, from the McKenzie, McKenzie, which Dr. Salman also mentioned, from the McKenzie Global Institute, they have uh, done a very remarkable job. Uh, then the net zero emission scenario global from the um, uh, another institute, which are doing very well, which is the coalition of the uh, central banks and the uh, supervisors working on uh, this uh, net zero economy. And uh, then, of course, the net zero economy index, which you have already mentioned in your brief introduction. I will not go into detail. I will just show one slide that how it looks like the net zero economy index. And the most important thing before understanding the status of Pakistan for me is uh, the characteristics of the net zero economy transition with Dr. Salman also mentioned in his presentation that there, the transition path is very important to understand. If you want to understand the net zero economy, from where we are and where we are going. So that's very important for me to uh, to uh, understand. And then where does Pakistan stand in terms of transition to the net zero economy? So if you, uh, because we have already uh, discussed these things in, in a brief introduction, uh, that net zero refers to a state in which the greenhouse gas is going into the atmosphere and are balanced by the removal out of the atmosphere. But uh, the important thing is we need to reach net zero emissions in order to achieve the ambition of the Paris Agreement, which Dr. Salman mentioned, uh, which is to hold the global average temperature increase to well below 2 degrees centigrade, above the pre-industrial pre levels here. One of the things when we see, it, say, pre-industrial levels, normally we take it 1990, when the concentration of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was 350 parts per million. And I had an opportunity to uh, uh, get some lectures from the guy who actually developed this Kevin curve, the carbon dioxide concentration curve, uh, Dr. Kevin in the Strategic Institute of Oceanography in uh, University of California in San Diego. 
And I have seen his basically the machine that actually accounts for the carbon concentrations for each second uh, uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, so currently, uh, when I was there, I mean, I can say that when I was there, it was almost for, uh, reached 400 parts per million. Uh, recently, one of the report, I, I don't know exactly the report, but I remember the figure was 450 parts per million we have crossed. So we need to bring that unit of the concentration of carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere back to 350 parts per million. That's the 1990s level. Uh, so the IPCC special report, if you have, uh, if any one of you have a chance to visit, uh, on the global warming of 1.5 degrees centigrade makes it very clear that it is necessary to achieve a global balance uh, between emissions and remorse by 2050. Now, that's one of the targets, 2050, in order to keep the rise in global temperatures below 1.5 degrees centigrade. So that's uh, one of the important things. Now, the second thing to understand is, uh, because we are talking about the net zero economy, of course, we want to go somewhere. We want to change our attitudes, our behaviors. There are certain actors in the world who need to change their behaviors. And if they want to change, then it is important to understand, as Dr. Salman mentioned again, that there are a lot of factors, consumers, supply side, from demand side, from the policy side, from the voters, the consumers, everybody. So a lot of things need to be done. So for that reason, we need to understand where the emissions actually are coming from. So this figure, if you can see here, uh, it includes all the fossil, when I, like the share of emissions, when I say the emissions, it includes all the fossil fuels like the carbon dioxide sources, as well as the short cycle emissions from large scale biomass burning to forest fires. Now the power includes emissions from the uh, electricity and heat generation. That is from combined heat and power plants. So if you see the industry, it includes uh, various industrial processes, including the production of the steel, cement, and chemicals, and extraction and refining of oil, gas, and coal. Uh, mobility includes emissions from the road, aviation, rail, maritime, and other forms of transportation. Buildings uh, include emissions from heating, cooking, and lighting from the commercial and residential buildings. Agriculture includes emissions from the direct form energy use and fishing. And forestry includes nest flux of uh, carbon dioxide uh, from the land use and land use change. Uh, I will talk uh, in detail later on because I worked a lot uh, in Pakistan on this sector, especially when developing the uh, uh, best levels for the forest reference emission levels from where we want to uh, take stock of our carbon performance in the future. So waste includes emissions from the solid waste disposal and treatment, uh, then the incineration and wastewater treatment. So now here, the uh, uh, one of the IPCC report, if anybody has seen the fifth assessment report, they issued a quote read uh, that uh, there is more than a 50% chance that there will be that we will reach 1.5 degrees centigrade warming within the next two decades if emissions come continue at their current rate. So these are the emissions in the slide you can see. If these continue in the current rate. There yeah, is more than a 50% chance for me. I mean, more than a 50% chance that we will reach uh, 1.5 degrees in the economy. Now, what needs to be done? Uh, so if you see that because these emissions are now, the existing emissions are too high, and the countries are responsible for setting their own policies, which is zero. And uh, of course, the delivery of these policies will be at local level. Now, to ensure a significant strengthening of climate commitment from all the countries, cities, and businesses, a global campaign of race to the net zero was started in 2020. Now, what is race to the net zero? It, it was basically launched on World Environment Day 2020 as a global campaign to rally the leadership and support from businesses, cities, regions, investors for a healthy, resilient, zero carbon recovery that prevents future threats, create decent jobs, and unlock inclusive sustainable growth. Now, the most important thing from the economic point of view here for the race to the net zero is that 
The corporate commitments alone under Race to Zero campaign now cover over 50% of the global economy, 15% of the global economy, and US dollars 9.81 trillion in revenue. And it is joined by nearly 800 cities, 31 regions covering 0.62 billion people with credible climate action commitments. Now, at a national level, countries have also stepped up during the pandemic with Japan, South Korea, and the United States joining the European Union, UK, South Africa, Chile, and other countries. So that's uh, one of the ambitious uh, campaigns now uh, going on. So now if you see actually what is the scenario, 2050 scenario, if you see that uh, by 2030, uh, now, this scenario is basically uh, published by the Network of Greening Financial Systems, which is a coalition of the billing gathering central banks and supervisors working on climate and green finance issues. So if you see this scenario by 20, like by 2030, of course, uh, with the COP uh, commitments or the COP26 said that we, sh we must half our emissions targets uh, by 2030 and then go to net zero by 2050. So if you see 2030, it shows almost the half. And then if you go down further 2050, it shows almost the net balance between the emissions by sources and removals by sinks. So that's very important to understand uh, how this scenario looks like in the, by 2050. Now, that's the net zero economy index 2021 that uh, Dr. Saiba uh, initially mentioned in her, in her uh, introductory uh, presentation. Uh, that we need to reach uh, at 1.9% uh, at uh, annual global rate of decarbonization uh, to limit the warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. But let me go further because this has already been... So what are the characteristics? Now, this is very important if we want to understand where Pakistan stands. These six characteristics uh, came from the net zero transition by McHenry Global Institute Research which is published in January 2022. This is very recent. So if you see, uh, the first characteristics is it should be universal. Means the transition would need to be universal. Indeed, a net zero emission can be achieved if and only if all energy and land use systems that contribute to the emissions are decarbonized, as these contributions are significant in all cases. All the economic sectors and all countries would need to participate. Let me give you an example. Suppose recently, uh, during the pandemic in 2021, the UK government uh, made a free trade agreement with India. Now, on the one side, the UK government is trying to get neutral uh, before 2050. And they have introduced almost so many um, uh, targets like the electric vehicles, low carbon emission zones in the country here in UK. But is it fair enough that on one side they are setting their own targets, but on the other side to a free trade agreement from India, which has 70% of its energy consumption from coal. So on the other side, the things they are bringing to their country, they have huge, huge use of uh, fossil fuels and coal energy. So on the other side, you are promoting one thing, of course, for yourself. And on the inner side, in the country level, you are going to do some other things like you are going to the net zero. So it needs to be balanced everywhere. So that's what it's, it says that in the first characteristics of the net zero economic transition, it should be universal. The second one is uh, that it should be significant means the scale of the required economic transformation would be significant. In particular, we estimate that the cumulative capi uh, capital spending on the physical assets of the net zero transition between 2021 and 20, 20, uh, 2050 would be about 275 trillion. This means that spending would need to rise from about 5.7 trillion today to the annual average of 9.2 trillion through 2050, which is an increase of 3.5 trillion. So accounting for expected increase in the spending, 
uh, as incomes and populations grow as well as for currently legislated uh, transition policies, the required increase in spending would be lower, but still about one trillion US dollars. So the third characteristics is front loaded. So these effects would be front loaded, of course, uh, when we go towards the transition. So spending would need to rise almost 9% of the GDP between 2026 and 2030 from about 7% today before falling. Likewise, we estimate that the delivered cost of electricity across the green uh, generation, transmission, distribution, storage, and including the operating costs, capital costs, and depreciation of existing and new assets uh, would rise by 25% between 2020 and 2040 in the scenario modeled here before falling from that peak, although this would vary across the regions. Now, one of the examples I can give you uh, in UK, because I'm, I'm, of course, I'm residing in UK, so I have been affected by these policies. In the UK, because they are going towards the transitioning, they have very like fast kind of um, ambitions, like going towards the electric vehicles, low emissions, and by 2030, they are almost putting ban on the diesel cars. And now they have put ban on you know, all over the UK, like any vehicle which is manufactured before 12, 212, they are banned in the country. So these are the policies. I mean, if you want to shift to someone, then you need to bring a lot of money initially into the transition period. Because Suppose if, if the UK government or if the countries need to stop the fossil fuel and the coal and everything, of course, there are the opportunity costs involved with it. If they want to stop it and if they want to transition to the renewable energy, there are a lot of capital investment needed to first go towards the transition and then lost the opportunity cost on the other side. So that needs, that's why it is front loaded. So the fourth thing is uneven. Uh, the transition would be felt unevenly uh, among the sectors, geographies, and communities, resulting in greater challenges uh, for some uh, constituencies than others. Like in, in case of Pakistan, as, men, as we discussed before with Dr. Salman, that uh, in case of Pakistan, we have a lot of issues, capacity issues. I can give you an example of one of the sectors, which is agriculture, forestry, and other land use, because I did the capacity assessment throughout the country for this uh, sector. Uh, so we have like data issues, we have uh, technical issues, we have technological issues, we have training issues, we have human resource issues, we have the knowledge issues, a uh, lot of capacity is required. Uh, so, but from the other country, from the other countries, if you see, they have far, far uh, ahead of us in terms of uh, transitions towards the net zero economy, but we need a lot of of pace actually to go there and we, this required a lot of resources particularly the financial resources so the fifth one is exposed to risks uh, the transition is laden with short-term risk even at the transition uh, as the transition will help manage long-term physical risk if poorly managed it would increase energy prices with implications from energy excess and affordability especially for the lower income households and regions. It would also have no known effects on the economy more broadly. Uh, if not well managed, there is a risk that the transition itself would be derailed. Now, the sixth one is rich in opportunity. Of course, despite the challenges with making economic and societal adjustments, the transitions would give rise to growth opportunities across the sectors and geographies. And critically, it would help avoid buildup of physical risks. So these are the main important six characteristics towards transition to the net zero economy. Now, based on these six characteristics, let me give you the economic overview of what Pakistan has pledged uh, in its uh, nationally determined contribution. Um, I'm also contributor to this for the Apollo sector for this document because we worked on um, uh, uh, when, it, when when Dr. Salman was saying that uh, there are some conditional and unconditional pledges that the government of Pakistan made. So what does it mean? Basically, if we say unconditional support, we mean that, okay, we have the resources. We can do it from our resources. We can do it from what we have been committed so far with the government of Pakistan, maybe the international donors, 
uh, uh, the World Bank, the other institutions that have placed uh, uh, some sort of financing to the government of Pakistan, maybe the provincial governments, maybe the federal government has placed through the PSDP projects or something. So we calculated all that amount for the Apollo sector. We said that, okay, these are the ongoing projects like the billion tree, how much uh, is committed to that project, like the sustainable forest management project, how much is committed to that project, Red Plus project and other projects. So the total cost of these projects is basically su uh, supported within the country. But if you have a projected emission uh, level, if you want to say that, okay, we have projected that our current emission levels will increase. But the most important thing here is because I have been through these uh, uh, consultations throughout the provinces with the, with the uh, stakeholders, I know exactly the issue, the data issue that I mentioned earlier. I mean, most probably the NDC document is presenting the targets or the current emission levels. First of all, the emission levels for each and every sector is not available in Pakistan. It's just based on the research studies. And they might have extrapolated those research studies at the country level that, okay, if this is coming from this sector, so this might be the national level there. These are the extrapolated values. So we have, we lay the data at the national level currently to, to set up our baselines. The only baseline available for me, I mean, because it was quite, it took two and a half years to, to establish the baseline for the agriculture, forestry, and other land uses. And currently, that baseline only includes the deforestation, not the degradation, not the other carbon pool, like the soil carbon, like the litter, like the dead wood carbon pool. So we can say that, okay, one million tons of carbon can be emitted in the next uh, uh, four years or five years by 20. Uh, uh, means the, the, the Apollo sector baseline is basically the 12, 2012. Pakistan chose 2012 as a baseline for the Apollo sector, and it's a uh, shows the emissions only from the deforestation and it is around appro approximately 1 million tons of CO2. Uh, so currently the other actions are being going on in Pakistan at the provincial level to develop the subnational forest monitoring systems. Uh, they will also uh, develop the subnational forest reference emission levels and they want to include all the carbon pools, including forest degradation activity as well. So it will be updated in near future in coming one year or two years. So, uh, yeah, so uh, Pakistan intends to, of course, set um, a cumulative ambitious aim of conditional and voluntary contribution, overall 50% reduction. Now, as I said, that it's, because it is projected, they were about to say that current one, they didn't say, this is very important to understand. They didn't say that we want to reduce 50% of the current emission. No, 50% of the projected emission, because they know that they are capacity issues. They know that there are resource constraints, financial resource constraints. So they need to bring a lot of resources into the country to make it possible to bring projected emissions 50 percent less by 2030. It's far. I mean, it's 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 way way before to tell that uh, we will go for the net zero because that that takes take a lot of time until 2050. So another important thing here is uh, is uh, I don't want to go into detail. I mean, just go through these slides if you can see the target set by pakistan by 2030 60 percent of energy produced in the country will generate from renewable energy now how i don't know it's very ambitious it's very ambitious how the government will go by that way it's very important to understand so 30 percent of the all new vehicles sold in pakistan uh, uh transportation you can also see it will be electric vehicles long way to go to be honest it's very ambitious target now for coal from uh, for land use change and forestry they have different targets so here uh, because dr salman mentioned about the tsunami program so the tsunami program will sequester 148.76 million tons of co2 equivalent emissions over the next 10 years uh, so the estimated project cost of about 800 million is being met nationally, which I mentioned earlier, that it is the unconditional support. So if we are meeting this target nationally from indigenous resources as unconditional uh, contribution. So, yeah, and then if you can see adapt from on adaptation, there are recharge Pakistan, protected areas, then 
uh, energy sector. Now, this is very important. I want to mention something here from the economic point of view. If you see that high priority actions from the energy sector, they have set up additional than the hydropower, then the transmission and coal. So these are the four important sectors in the energy which they have ambitious targets. But this cost of energy transition alone would require US dollar 101 billion by 2030 and additional US dollar 65 billion by 2040 on account of completing the in progress renewable energy projects. It means these are already in progress. So huge amount is required and phasing out of coal and replacing with hydropower. So Pakistan will require finance and technology transfer and capacity building in line with the Article 4, which Dr. Salman mentioned that Article 4 says that developing countries need support, financial support from the developed countries. So another thing here is if you can see what are the current commitments. So World Bank endorses Pakistan's Climate Vision 2021. Uh, lending data showing that Pakistan is leading the world in climate action. A massive 44% of its mainstream development funding now climate compatible to an on-ground initiative like as mentioned earlier, the tsunami project, the clean energy and the protected area initiative. It is also very important that different actors across different sectors should move in a synchronization to support the transition in a way that ultimately benefits them all. While every sector is unique. Now I'm talking about in, in perspective of Pakistan, every sector is unique and complex. But my opinion, in my opinion, five sector key actors or groups required to drive the transition. One is supply side, which are the companies, for example, the uh, manufacturers, the producers, supply chain. The second one is the demand side companies, for example, the retailers, service providers, distributors. The third one is the finance sectors, for example, the investors, asset managers, asset owners, banks, public funds. Uh, the fourth one is the policy makers, for example, the countries, cities, states, regions. And the fifth one is the civil society, the customer, waters, universities, sports teams, local organizations. When each of these groups of actors can see each other working towards a common goal, their actions and progress are mutually uh, reinforcing and it becomes possible to overcome obstacles to net zero economy transition in Pakistan. And uh, I will leave with one of the question here to as a brainstorming or to think for the participants that who will pay for the transition after all this, like the conditional support, who is going to pay, uh, which is 35%. And I already mentioned the figures, 101 billion uh, till 2030, only for the energy sector, 65 billion for the till 25. So it makes up like maybe 300 or 400 billion dollars Pakistan would need to go to the net zero economy. So who is going to pay for this? That's that's a very important question. And that's where we need to think a lot. That's where the opportunities of the financing should be uh, searched and uh, studied uh, and and throughout the different actors, as I mentioned. And one of the uh, things that I think uh, regarding the carbon markets, uh, when Dr. Salman was mentioning, maybe the next presenter would know. I would like to update because I'm still working for Pakistan, government of Pakistan as a consultant. Uh, we are currently developing the action plans for the Apollo sectors for the provinces. Uh, and I'm leading those action plans. Uh, five provinces, we have completed the draft action plan and uh, only the Punjab province, I'm still working on it. Uh, we have had a very brief consultation throughout the provinces with the stakeholders. Uh, we are trying to see exactly what is the status of the carbon, either it should be recognized as environmental service or either it should be recognized as a forest product or either it should be recognized as a commodity. And uh, so we are we, we have recently uh, issued a survey through Survey Monkey, and we have received almost 15 responses on it. And we are further looking for the responses from the provincial, federal governments and the civil society, private sector, NGOs, so uh, when we have, when we will complete the survey, uh, we will incorporate those into the action plan. And we are also working on the benefit sharing mechanism for the Apollo sector, especially the, for the Red Plus mechanism. That once the carbon credits are coming, how we are going to distribute these carbon credits uh, to the federal government? What would be the share of the federal government? What would be the share of the provincial government? 
and uh, the owners, the users groups, the concessionists. So this is now uh, in progress. Uh, regarding the carbon markets, also this is one of the issues. The carbon markets need to be regularized in the country, uh, which is still uh, in progress. So that's all from my side. If any questions, thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Assalamu alaikum. Hello. How are you, Amiri? Assalamu alaikum. Amiri, how are you, sir? Ji, ji, are you? Was muted. Thank you so much. Kamran Saab, once again, I'm very sorry for the disruption, the technical disruption, the power was off for, for two minutes. So I'm extremely sorry for that. And uh, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. <coughs> it was really, very, uh, very informative. And uh, you have really asked a billion dollar question that who is going to pay for Pakistan's transition to net zero economy. But you have mentioned this, uh, that uh, the commitment that has been made by the World Bank or the process of making, uh, I don't know what is World Bank is going to pay for. Is it going to be the uh, loan? Is it going to be the grant? Or is it going to be some some amount which is in charity or something? Uh, if the World Bank is uh, making any commitment, on what, what grounds they are actually, these commitments are being made? So this is my question. And uh, the high priority action that uh, you have talked about that has been set by Pakistan uh, regarding the mitigation actions and the adaptation. So I think these uh, priority actions need some kind of a strategy first. Have uh, Pakistan's government, uh, those who are working on these uh, issues of net zero economy, and you have said that you have also you are also involved in this as a consultant. So is there any strategy behind this, uh, all these priority actions the government is talking about and you, you have also talked about it? Strategy without any proper, very systematic and uh, thought out strategy, the actions are not going to actually uh, be successful. So these are a few observations on my part, if you would like to reply. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Of course, uh, for different sectors uh, here, the N in NDC, actually, the government of Pakistan trying to what trying to expose is they are not going into the detail. Uh, but of course, when they submit their um, uh, national communication, which is a brief document of uh, uh, that that actually uh, explains in detail the sector wise uh, issues, uh, what actually the current emissions are in the uh, in every sector and then what is the progress and uh, what uh, gaps are there in terms of capacity and what is required to enhance in terms of capacity and what financial resources are required. So that's the important document, national communication, uh, which uh, government of Pakistan has submitted recently, the third national communication uh, after I think the second one was submitted uh, almost eight or nine years ago and then third one was submitted recently. So uh, it needs to be submitted every four years for the developed countries, but developing countries have some ways that they need to submit it voluntarily. So the strategies are mentioned there. So each and every sector has its own strategy, actually. Based on those strategies, they come up with these targets in the national uh, uh, determined contribution document. For example, because I'm not uh, into the other sectors, but I can tell you about the sectors like the agriculture, forestry, and other land use. So in our sector, we have uh, one of the important thing was to uh, develop the like, for example, the Red Plus mechanism when the Pakistan submitted his Red Readiness proposal and I'm one of the co-author of their proposal in 2013 to the World Bank. Uh, the World Bank placed 3.8 million US dollars to Pakistan to become Red Plus ready. Uh, 
for the red plus mechanism which is reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation and the plus refers to the sustainable management of forest uh, conservation and enhancement of forest carbon stocks so for that mechanism we have four requirements uh, which is called the versa framework for red plus under that decision there were four requirements one was uh, the countries needs to have their national red plus strategy which is now ready which is completed which is available online if you go to www.red-pakistan.org you can find their strategy there the second thing was to have their robust and transparent national forest monitoring system in place i can say that the work for the action plan the work for the national forest monitoring system is already have been done and the document is complete but it needs to be in place they are working uh, even the web portal is complete now uh, they are just working on some other sub national level to link it with the national forest monitoring system and once it is completed you will see a complete digitized uh, platform to see the national forest monitoring system and you can track province wise even compartment level data on it and you can download you can request there are some security protocols as well on the platform the third one was to uh, have uh, the safeguard information system in place the safeguards might be like maybe possible that because of the implementation of red plus there might be different kind of policy interventions by the government of pakistan and because of those policy interventions the rights of the people the jobs the opportunity cost involved in it the livelihoods that might get affected so how to safeguard these things there are seven safeguards according to the cancun agreement uh, of the under the species of un un triple c so that need to be ensured actually on this the safeguard information system uh, i mean there the document is now available uh, the uh, mechanisms have been uh, set up but uh, implementation has not uh, you cannot expect the implementation at this stage as uh, the pakistan is going through uh, the provincial reduction plans uh, which are being developed the uh, pilot based forest management plans which are being developed so once these action plans and the management plans will be implemented uh, the mechanisms which have been developed they will automatically run along these pilot projects uh so another thing was uh, to develop for the pakistan was its forest reference emission levels uh, which is called the fell or the forest reference level or forest reference emission level there is not there is only difference is if the if the country uh, uh report its emissions net emissions from the country then it's called forest reference emission level but if the country reports its net removals from the country from the forestry sector it is called forest reference level so there is not a big difference so now the pakistan fell has been established and i can i i'm very pleased to say that the pakistan fell is improved from india and nepal it is complete it is robust and it has been reviewed by the unfccc technical uh, review panel uh, uh which is called the tap technical assessment uh, panel and uh, it has been now published also on the unfccc red web platform so these requirements have been met the strategies are there so these national strategies are now uh we are now bringing down towards provincial level we are trying to align the national strategy national commitments towards the provincial level at the provincial level we are trying to include all those national policy guidelines at the provincial level and then the provincial action plan will automatically be a provincial strategy for the red plus implementation for the forest sector and of course on side by side with these documents there are other documents that highlight the capacity issues so there is a strategy there is a cost uh, um, we have worked on out on the costs as well like how much costs are required to implement the national forest monitoring system what capacities are required how many trainings are required how many people need to be trained in what sectors in what areas so this is all ready available and regarding other sectors i'm sure they are also working on other sectors and recently world bank has uh, I, i i forget the name of that actually uh it's called i think iris or something that pakistan named uh, and we recently in the, i think in 2021 the world bank committed 826 million us dollars to climate change ministry and they have like different uh, i i totally forget the name actually they have given the specific name to their fund and the provinces can access that fund by submitting their 
proposals under different categories. They have three different categories of that fund. One of the category is to this uh, 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 nature-based solutions. They are technology-based solutions, nature-based solutions. If the provinces want to access that fund, I think if the universities can able be uh, universities can also access that fund under the research component. Uh, there is a research component in different activities as well. So yes, and then the Ministry of Climate Change is fully authorized to um, decide on those funds, how to uh, issue those funds to the provinces. So that's that's what I know. Uh, but other sectors, I exactly don't know what they are doing. But I'm sure there are strategies for the other sectors as well. Thank you so much again for your very, very uh, detailed reply and uh, response to my question. I think uh, uh, some of the students, the attendees here, they would like to ask you. I think somebody started talking, Imran. Are you there? Yeah, yeah. Would I'm you here. Like Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum Wa alaikum. Uh, sir, can you hear me? Yes, I can ah. hear you. Okay. सर असल में मेरा सवाल ये था ना उस टाइम पे कि हमारा तो इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर ही डेवलप नहीं हुआ है और जो मलक अमीन असलम साहब का जो स्टेटमेंट था कि वी आर नॉट इवन प्लेजिंग टू रिमूव दी कार्बन व्हाट वी नीड टू डू इन द फ्यूचर ये सर हम पॉलिटिकल इन्फ्लुएंस को कैसे कन्विंस कर सकते हैं पोलिटिकल बॉडीज को क्योंकि सर अगर उनकी तरफ से एक विलिंगनेस आ जाती है तो फिर पॉलिसी मेकर्स भी उन्हीं पार्टीज के लिए काम कर रहे हैं करंट गवर्नमेंट के लिए काम कर रहे हैं वो भी इसी तरह फिर पॉलिसीज डिजाइन करेंगे फंड एलोकेशन फिर उसी तरह होगी कि चीजें डी कार्बनाइज हो जाएंगी बट सर मुझे अब रिसेंट फ्यूचर में मुझे नजर नहीं आ रहा है कि वी आर गोइंग टू डू दिस आपकी बात सही है लेकिन एक चीज मैं आपको जरूर कहूंगा कि जो पोलिटिकल फिगर्स होते हैं वो अपनी तरफ से कमिटमेंट जरूर कर लेते हैं लेकिन उसके पीछे कुछ टेक्निकल जो साइड होती है वो बड़ी इंपॉर्टेंट होती है कि टेक्निकली उनको कंट्री सिचुएशन के बारे में किस तरह बताया जाए मिसाल के तौर पर मैंने एक सवाल शुरू में छोड़ा था मैं आपको एक एग्जांपल दे देता हूं मैंने कहा कि हु इज गोइंग टू पे अब जब आप पे करना चाहें पाकिस्तान जैसे कंट्री में जहाँ से जहाँ पे पहले से ही हमारी जी डी जो है वो इकोनॉमिक ग्राउथ रेट डाउन चला गया फिर हम अब पे चले गए लेकिन बहुत सारा डेप्ट हमारे ऊपर है देखें जब हम ट्रांजिशन की बात करते हैं ना उसको मैनेज करने की हमें कैपिटल चाहिए हमें कैपिटल इन्वेस्टमेंट चाहिए वो कैपिटल इन्वेस्टमेंट कहाँ से आएगा या तो दो ही चीजें हो सकती है ना या डेप्ट पे आप कर सकते हैं या इक्विटी पे कर सकते हैं या टैक्सेज लगा के कर सकते हैं कंपनीज पे या प्रोडक्ट्स पे आप टैक्सेज लगा सकते हैं या तो आपको इंटरनेशनल फंडिंग मिले इतनी ज्यादा इस यूज अमाउंट में अब जब आप कुछ कमिटमेंट्स आप इस लेवल पे करें जैसे आप अभी आईएमएफ के पास पाकिस्तान चला गया आईएमएफ के पास चला गया आईएमएफ क्यों बार बार कह रहा है कि आप अपने टैक्सेस बढ़ाओ ये करो वो करो क्योंकि उनको पता है कि इनके फाइनेंशियल रिसोर्सेज जिस पेज से ये आगे इकोनॉमिक ग्राउथ हो रही है उस हिसाब से इनके अपने रिसोर्सेज जनरेट नहीं हो रहे और ये टोटली डिपेंडेंट है फॉरन फंडिंग के ऊपर अपने रिसोर्सेज जनरेट होंगे तो अपने रिसोर्सेज जनरेट करने के लिए किसी एटीट्यूड को चेंज करने के लिए बिहेवियर को चेंज करने के लिए जब कंट्री के ऊपर बात आती है कंट्री ने चेंज करना है तो कंट्री ने तो टैक्सेस के साथ करना है तो जब पॉलिटिकल फिगर्स जब आते हैं शुरू में तो कमिटमेंट दे देते हैं मैं एक और मिसाल भी देता हूं आपको 2012 में क्लाइमेट चेंज पॉलिसी आई क्लाइमेट चेंज पॉलिसी ने क्लियरली उसके अंदर स्ट्रेटेजिक पॉलिसी ऑप्शन आए कि हम कोल को डिस्करेज करेंगे टू में जब नून लीग की गवर्नमेंट आई थी उस वक्त एनर्जी क्राइसिस आया था उन्होंने अपनी नेशनल एनर्जी पॉलिसी निकाली और उस पॉलिसी के अंदर सिंध के अंदर कोल के जो जखायर थे उनको कहा कि हम ज्यादा उसमें जो है वो एक्सप्लोर करेंगे और उनको यूज करेंगे तो यहाँ पे तो गवर्नमेंट की अपनी पॉलिसीज कंफ्लिक्ट होगी तो ये डिपेंड करता है कंट्री सिचुएशंस के ऊपर कि आप किन इकोनॉमिक सिचुएशंस के थ्रू गुजर रहे हो अब ये मुख्तलि फैक्टर्स है मैंने आपको पहले भी बताया जैसे अब मैं आपको एक और मिसाल देता हूँ आप यहाँ पे डेवलप्ड कंट्रीज में आप देखें हमारे यहाँ पे जो है वो बहुत बड़े बड़े जो कंपनीज हैं उनके ऊपर कैप एंड ट्रेड सिस्टम है गवर्नमेंट की तरफ से एक कैप लगाया गया है कि आप इससे ज्यादा एमिट नहीं कर सकते अगर आप एमिट करते हो तो यू आर लीगली बाइंड कि आप इसका या तो आप टैक्स के थ्रू पर पे करोगे या दूसरा एक छोटी सी एग्जांपल और देता हूँ क्या पाकिस्तान ये कर सकता है हमारे बेशक कमिट कर दें मलिक अमिश्न असलम जाके कहे जी हाँ मैं ट्रांसपोर्टेशन सेक्टर को बंद कर दूंगा अगले उसमें मैं 50 परसेंट जो है जाके ट्रांसपोर्टेशन को मैं रिन्यूएबल पे चलाऊंगा 
کو رینیویبل پہ چلانے کے لیے میں نے آپ کو پہلے بھی بتایا کہ ان پروگرس جو ہے ان کو ہائیڈرو پاور کی طرف جانے کے لیے 101 بلین چاہیے 2030 تک کیا ملک امین اسلام یہ کمیٹ کر سکتا ہے کہ ہاں میرے پاس 101 بلین ہے اور میں ٹرانسپورٹیشن سیکٹر کو جو ہے وہ رینیویبل انرجی پہ لے کے جا سکتا ہوں یا انرجی سیکٹر کو رینیویبل پہ لے کے جا سکتا ہوں نہیں ان کو یہ پتا ہوتا ہے کہ ہمارے پاس 101 بلین نہیں ہے اور نہ ان کے پاس فیوچر کوئی کمیٹمنٹ ظاہر ہے کہ ہمارے پاس ہاں یہ کمیٹمنٹ ہے ہمیں کسی نے یہ تسلی دی ہے کہ ہم اتنے دے رہے ہیں پھر وہ کمیٹ کر سکتا ہے لیکن اگر وہ کمیٹ کر کے آئے گا کل کو اگر وہ اس کمیٹمنٹ کو پورا نہیں کرتا یہاں پہ پرابلمس کریٹ ہوتی ہے کنٹری کا جو انٹرنیشنل امیج ہے وہ خراب ہو جاتا ہے اور آگے جو ڈونرز جب ہماری پروگرس پرفارمنس دیکھتے ہیں وہ تو اسی حساب سے دیتے ہیں کہ جو کمیٹمنٹ ہم کرتے ہیں اس پہ ہم کتنا پورا ہوتے ہیں اس کی بیس پہ وہ دے دیتے ہیں ایک چھوٹی سی مثال آپ کے سمجھانے کے لیے جو ڈیلی لائف ہماری میٹر کرتی ہے میں نے پہلے بھی ایگزامپل میں کہا کہ یو کے کے اندر جو ہے لو ایمیشن زونس قائم کیے گئے ہیں اگر اس لو ایمیشن زون کے اندر آپ کی گاڑی جاتی ہے آپ کو ڈیلی کے حساب سے آٹھ پاؤنڈ پے کرنے پڑتے ہیں تقریباً ٹو تھاؤزینڈ روپیز ہوتے ہیں کیا پاکستان کی عوام میں مین سٹیز میں لو ایمیشن زون کریٹ کریں اور روزانہ کے دو ہزار روپے دے دیں ان کو بتایا جائے کیا پاکستانی عوام روزانہ کے دو ہزار پے کر سکتی ہے کبھی بھی نہیں پے کر سکتی تو ایسے ٹارگیٹس جو ایسے پالیسی ایکشنز جو ہوتے ہیں جو پاکستانی سچویشن کے مطابق ہمارے لیے فیزبل ہوتے ہیں ہم اسی کو بیس بنا کے اپنی کمٹمنٹس کو پروجیکٹ کرتے ہیں اگر ہم ایک کمٹ کریں ہاں جی نیٹ زیرو پوری دنیا جا رہی ہے نیٹ زیرو کی طرف کیوں نہ ہم بھی ایک کمٹمنٹ کر کے آئیں نہیں ایسا نہیں ہو سکتا کیونکہ آپ کو اپنی کنٹری کی سچویشن کو سمجھنا ہے اس لیے کہ اگر وہ ٹرانزیشن پیریڈ ہم نے مینیج کرنا ہے میں نے ایک ایگزامپل پہلے بھی دی کہ اگر ہمارا ٹرانزیشن پورلی مینیج ہوتا ہے تو وہ اس کا جو امپیکٹ ہوتا ہے وہ سوسائٹی پہ ہوتا ہے سوسائٹی کے اوپر بہت سارے رسک جو ہیں وہ آپ ان کی سوشل اکنامک لائف کو تباہ کر رہے ہوتے ہیں تو ہمارے ٹرانزیشن کو مینیج کرنے کے لیے ضروری ہے کہ ہم کنٹری کی سچویشن جو ہمارے نیشنل سرکمسٹانسز ہیں اسی حساب سے ہم آگے جا کے کمٹ کریں کیونکہ اگر وہ ٹرانزیشن مینیج کرنے کے لیے کہیں ہاں جی ہم کول اور اس کو ختم کر دیں اب اس کو ختم کریں گے لیکن اس کے اوپر جو پیچھے انویسٹمنٹس ہوئی ہیں جو ضائع ہوگا اس سے ریلیٹڈ جابس جو تھی وہ ساری ضائع ہو جائیں گی دیز آر اپرچونیٹی کاسٹ ان کو کون پے کرے گا اور اگر ہم رینیویبل کی طرف جاتے ہیں رینیویبل کا میں نے آپ کو فیگرز بتایا ٹو ہنڈریڈ بلین ڈالرس کہاں سے لائیں گے یہ تھوڑی ریئلٹیز ہیں جن کو سمجھنا ہوتا ہے اور اسی حساب سے پھر کمٹمنٹس کرنی پڑتی ہیں تو میرے خیال سے ملک امین اسلم کو جب ٹیکنیکلی یہ چیز سمجھائی جاتی ہے تو وہ پولیٹیکل فگر تھوڑا سا انٹرنیشنل لیول پہ پھر احتیاط کرنی پڑتی ہے تو میرے خیال میں ہی واز ریئلسٹک وین ہی سیٹ جیسے انڈیا کی مثال لے لیں انڈیا نے پہلے کہا تھا ہم نیٹ زیرو ٹو تھاؤزینڈ پہ جائیں گے لیکن مودی نے آ کے کوپ ٹوئنٹی سکس میں بیان دیا کہ نہیں ہم نیٹ زیرو ٹو تھاؤزینڈ سیونٹی میں جائیں گے اس نے چینج کیوں کیا ٹوئنٹی ایئرس کا کیونکہ وہ پولیٹیکل بیان تھا بعد میں ٹیکنیکلی اس کو انڈرسٹینڈ ہو گیا کہ نہیں پولیٹیکلی ٹیکنیکلی ہم ٹو تھاؤزینڈ ففٹی میں نہیں کر سکتے بیکاز سیونٹی پرسینٹ آف دیئر انرجی از فرام دی کول ان کو یہ اندازہ ہے کہ ہمارا ٹرانزیشن پیریڈ لمبا ہے ہم نے بہت لمبے عرصے تک ٹرانزیشن کو مینیج کرنا ہے سو ہی واز فون ڈیٹ فرام ٹوئنٹی ففٹی ٹو ٹوئنٹی سیونٹی یہ چیزیں انڈرسٹینڈ کرنے والی ہیں تھینک یو اوکے تھینک یو سو مچ فار دس ریپلائی سر میرے خیال ہے ون مور شازیہ بانو شازیہ آپ کچھ پوچھنا چاہ رہی السلام علیکم میم وعلیکم السلام جی پوچھیں واٹس یور کوشچن میم بہت ہی سمپل سا کوشچن ہے اس پرٹیکولر مسئلے کے حوالے سے اسپیشلی نیٹ زیرو اکانومی میں ہم پروڈیوسر سائڈ چیک کر رہے ہیں گورنمنٹ سائڈ کے حوالے سے بات کر رہے ہیں فنڈنگ کی بات کر رہے ہیں صرف یہ چھوٹا سا کوشچن پوچھنا چاہوں گی کہ اس میں پبلک کا کیا رول ہے عام لوگوں کو کس طرح اس چیز کے لیے کنوینس کیا جا سکتا ہے یا ان کو اس پورے پروسیس میں کیسے ان کی دلچسپی کو کیسے پرووک کیا جا سکتا ہے یہ چھوٹا سا ایک سوال ہے آپ سے تھینک یو دیکھیے جب ہم پبلک کی بات کرتے ہیں تو ہمارے پاس ڈیمانڈ سائڈ آ جاتی ہے کہ آپ کی ڈیمانڈ جو ہے وہ موسٹلی کہاں سے آتی ہے آپ کی پبلک سے آتی ہے اگر آپ کی پبلک کو میں مثال کے طور پر دیکھیں آپ یہ جو 2021 میں انرجی پرائسز ہائی ہو گئے تو انرجی پرائسز ہائی ہو گئے ڈیمانڈ کہاں سے تھا پبلک کی طرف سے تھا نا کس کے لیے تھا فوسل فیول کے لیے تھا تو ڈیمانڈ زیادہ ہو گئی فوسل فیول پرائسز انکریز ہو گئے ساتھ ساتھ کنٹریز جو ہیں وہ کیا کرتی ہیں وہ شفٹس کی طرف جاتی ہیں وہ پلیجز کرتی ہیں اب وہ پلیجز جب
तो डेफिनेटली फिर गवर्नमेंट को गवर्नमेंट्स को या दूसरे एक्टर्स को अपनी पूरी की पूरी पॉलिसी या ट्रांजेक्शन चेंज करना पड़ता है जैसे अभी वहीकल्स का मैंने बताया अगर एक गवर्नमेंट प्लेस करती है कि बाई टू तक मैं तो टोटली इलेक्ट्रिक कार्स को लेके आऊंगी तो पब्लिक का जो डिमांड है वो खत्म हो जाएगी पेट्रोल रूस से क्योंकि वो उनको पता है कि आगे जाके मैंने पूरा का पूरा मेरा आ, ये गाड़ी तो चलनी नहीं है तो वो तो हमेशा ये देखता है कि कौन सा मेरे लिए ज्यादा फिजिबल है फ्यूचर में तो वो तो उसकी सारी डिमांड शिफ्ट हो जाएगी रिन्यूएबल की तरफ तो रिन्यूएबल की तरफ शिफ्ट हो जाएगी रिन्यूएबल की डिमांड बढ़ेगी तो रिन्यूएबल का ज्यादा आगे जो है उसकी ट्रांजेक्शन होगा और इसी तरह अगर एक पब्लिक है जो इलेक्ट्रिक व्हीकल यूज करता है अगर वो ये कहता है कि मैं इलेक्ट्रिक व्हीकल यूज करता हूँ मेरे लिए इलेक्ट्रिक जो चार्जिंग पॉइंट्स होने चाहिए वो थ्रू आउट द कंट्री होने चाहिए अब वो डिमांड करेगा तो होगा क्या कि गवर्नमेंट फिर इलेक्ट्रिक चार्जिंग पॉइंट्स लगाने के लिए फिर एक ह्यूज अमाउंट चाहिए होगी गवर्नमेंट फिर अपनी स्पेंडिंग सारी की सारी जीडीपी की जो परसेंटेज है स्पेंडिंग की वो उधर लगाएगी कि हाँ जी मैं इतना परसेंट जी का मैं इस पर लगाऊंगी तो वो सारा तो एक और मिसाल देता हूँ पब्लिक के हवाले से चाइना ने मोस्टली जो कंट्रीज हैं वो क्या करते हैं जब वो कॉप में जाते हैं तो वो अपनी जो कमिटमेंट्स हैं वो परसेंटेज में देते हैं सेक्टर वाइज वो कहते हैं जी हम ओवरऑल कंट्री का इतना कम करेंगे फॉरेस्ट्री से इतना कम करेंगे वेस्ट से इतना पावर से इतना चाइना ने ये नहीं किया चाइना ने अपनी कमिटमेंट एंड डी के अंदर जीडीपी के साथ लिंक कर दी वो तो थोड़े से चालाकी की उन्होंने वहां पे उन्होंने सेक्टर वाइज कमिटमेंट नहीं दी उन्होंने कहा कि हम जी का इतना परसेंट जो है वो हम एमिशन लो करेंगे जैसे मैडम ने एक दिया कि वो जो एक एग्जाम्पल थी इंडेक्स का नेट जीरो इकोनॉमी इंडेक्स 2021 उन्होंने कहा टन ऑफ कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड पर डॉलर ऑफ जीडीपी तो चाइना तो उसकी तरफ चला गया वो कहता है कि जी हम जीडीपी का इतना कम करेंगे अब वो जीडीपी का कम करने का मतलब ये है कि वो एक वो ऐसी पॉलिसीज लेके आएंगे जो पब्लिक के अंदर पब्लिक स्पेंडिंग को इंकरेज करेंगे कि आप अपनी स्पेंडिंग जो है वो इस तरफ लेके जाए और वो अपनी नेशनल लेवल पे तो ये बिहेवियर बेसिकली सारा का सारा पब्लिक की तरफ से आता है अगर पब्लिक अपने एटीट्यूड के अंदर अपने डिमांड्स के अंदर अपने हैबिट्स के अंदर चेंजिंग ले आए और हम अपने रिन्यूएबल्स की तरफ चले जाएं, तो डेफिनेटली इसका सारा असर कंपनीज पे भी पड़ेगा सप्लाई साइड पे पड़ेगा पॉलिसी साइड पे पड़ेगा और ये पूरा का पूरा ट्रांजेक्शनिंग ये डिमांड की वजह से होता है ओके थैंक यू सो मच समर आप कुछ पूछना चाह रहे हैं जी जी मैडम आवाज आ रही हाँ आ रही आवाज सर सर मेरा सवाल ये था कि मोस्टली हम इन्वायरमेंट की जितनी भी पॉलिसीज बना रहे हैं मगर पहले भी मैंने काफ़ी टीचर्स से भी डिस्कस किया इस हवाले से हमारी जो पहले से जो प्रोजेक्ट्स हैं जो मतलब कि इन्वायरमेंटल मतलब कि पोल्यूशन वगैरह कर रहे हैं वो ही हम अभी तक प्रॉपरली नहीं इम्प्लीमेंट कर सके तो हमारी डेवलपमेंट जो है इतनी ज़्यादा नहीं है हमारा इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर इतना ज़्यादा बेहतर नहीं है वो हर हवाले से हम जो भी देखें कि जो हमारी आ, मतलब टेक्नोलॉजी है वो इतनी एफिशिएंट नहीं है कि मतलब उसमें इमिशन कम हो तो ये ये हम किस तरफ मतलब कि जा रहे हैं कि हम के एक तरफ से पॉलिसी कमिटमेंट इंटरनेशनल कर रहे हैं कि हम जो है ना इमिशंस कम करेंगे दूसरी तरफ से हमारी अपनी जो मतलब कि रियल इनकम जो हमारी है वो कम होती जा रही है जिस तरीके आपने कहा आईएमएफ की तरफ जा रहे हैं तो हम हम में तो इतना पोटेंशियल ही नहीं है इसका मतलब कि हम उनको चीज़ों को कर सकें हम अपनी इनकम को इंक्रीज करेंगे तो डेफिनेटली पोल्यूशन होगा तो हम तो मतलब इस तरीके से बढ़ते जाएंगे जैसे जैसे आप काम करेंगे तो कुछ ना कुछ पोल्यूशन होगा ही होगा और वो दिन ब दिन बढ़ता जाएगा कम नहीं होगा या तो आपका बिल्कुल इतना ज़्यादा इनकम बढ़ जाए ताकि आप जो है ना कि अपनी इनकम ज़्यादा बढ़ जाए ताकि आप जो नहीं कि वो जो टेक्नोलॉजिकल इम्प्रूवमेंट्स लाके आए और उसमें से आप पोल्यूशन कम करें सो ये ये जो है ना बहुत ज़्यादा कन्फ्यूजिंग है और हम जब अगर किसी जो बंदे जो है कामन पीपल्स हैं जब हम उनसे बात करते हैं तो वो उनका जहन में यही सवाल आता है कि ये किस तरीके से आप टैकल करेंगे सो इस पर थोड़े सा रोशनी डालिए देखिए एक चीज़ जो कुछ कंट्रीज है ना मैंने आपसे पहले भी कहा था कि शायद इसीलिए मलिक मईन असलम ने सिचुएशन को समझते हुए कहा था कि हम नेट जीरो पे नहीं जा सकते वो बिलीव नहीं करते क्योंकि पाकिस्तान की सिचुएशन ऐसी है कि वो एमिशन तो होंगे ही होंगे दूसरा जो 2030 का मैंने आपको एक बताया है कि एक टारगेट जो रखा है जिसमें मोस्टली कंट्रीज कहते हैं कि जी हम हाफ करेंगे या ये करेंगे वो तो एक और जब नेट जीरो इकोनॉमी की बात हुई तो एक प्लेजेस हो गए बेसिकली एक होता है पीकिंग पीरियड जैसे हम यू एन के जो डिस्कशन है उसमें हम उसे कहते हैं पीकिंग पीरियड उस पीकिंग पीरियड का मोस्टली कंट्रीज ने किसी ने 2030 रखा है कोई कहता है 2035 पे हम पीकिंग पे चले जाएंगे कोई कहता है जी 2040 पे हम पीकिंग पे चले जाएंगे और वो पीकिंग पीरियड उन्होंने इसी बेस पे
हमारी जो डेवलपमेंट होगी अब हमारी जब डेवलपमेंट होगी उसमें एमिशन जाहरी बातें होंगे क्योंकि हमारे पास टेक्नोलॉजी इशूज़ हैं हमारे पास टेक्निकल इशूज़ हैं तो हमारी डेवलपमेंट तो ग्रोथ तो जारी रहेगी तो हम बाय 2030 हम पीक पे जाएंगे लेकिन 2030 के बाद जब हम एक दफ़ा पीक पे पहुंच जाएंगे उसके बाद फिर हम अपने आप को जब हमारी इकोनॉमिक ग्रोथ स्टेबल हो जाएगी फिर हम कोशिश करेंगे उसको नीचे लाने की तो कुछ कंट्रीज़ ने ये थोड़ा सा प्लेस किया है अब अगर जो दो चीज़ें बड़ी इंपॉर्टेंट शुरू में मैंने बताया था पाकिस्तान कहता है कि जी फिफ्टीन हम अनकंडीशनल जी हमारे पास जो इकोनॉमिक ग्रोथ है उसमें जो हम कर सकते हैं हमने किया है वो 15 परसेंट हम दे रहे हैं सपोर्ट दे रहे हैं जी हम यहाँ यहाँ से पैसे ले रहे हैं हम लगा रहे हैं इससे चलो कुछ तो इम्पेक्ट होगा लेकिन वो जो प्रोजेक्शन जो उन्होंने बताया है कि 2030 तक हम जो प्रोजेक्शन है हमारी उसमें इतने एमिशन हो रहे हैं वो खुद बता रहे हैं कि हो रहे हैं इतने जो हमारे करंट एमिशन आ रहे हैं उस हिसाब से दो तक ये एमिशन हैं लेकिन उसका 15 फीसद जो हम एग्जिस्टिंग प्रोजेक्ट्स चला रहे हैं वो तो हम चलो किसी न किसी तरीके से कम करेंगे लेकिन उसका जो बिग मार्जिन है 35 परसेंट वो अगर आप हमें पैसे देंगे तो हम करेंगे अगर आप नहीं देंगे तो वो एमिशन है ही है यही तो वो बता रहे हैं कि हमें अगर आप सपोर्ट देते हो तो वो कंडीशनल है कंडीशनल मीन्स इस कंडीशन पर कि अगर आप हमें इतनी इतने पैसे लगेंगे उस थर्टी को कम करने के लिए अगर हमें वो पैसे दे दो तो हम पूरे लगा के उस 35 परसेंट को कम करेंगे लेकिन वो भी 50 परसेंट जो प्रोजेक्टेड है उसका 50 परसेंट प्रोजेक्टेड अगर 100 परसेंट है ये जहन में रखें प्रोजेक्टेड हो सकता है एक लाख टन हो मिसाल दे रहा हूँ वो तो मिलियंस में होगा एक लाख टन हो वो कह रहे हैं हम उस प्रोजेक्टेड का जो 2030 में एक लाख होगा उसका हम पचास जो है जो पचास टन जो है वो कम करेंगे लेकिन उस पचास में से भी पंद्रह हम कर रहे हैं अपने हिसाब से बाकी जो 35 फीसद है उस 50,000 का वो आप पैसे देंगे तो हम करेंगे नहीं तो हम नहीं कर सकते ये ये जो खुद पाकिस्तान बता रहा है ना ये इश्यूज हैं कैपेसिटी के और इसीलिए मैंने कहा कि हर सेक्टर बेशक ये हाईलाइट नहीं होता इसको ज़्यादा मीडिया पे या इतना डिस्कस नहीं किया जाता लेकिन हर सेक्टर कहीं ना कहीं इन कैपेसिटी इशूज के ऊपर इस ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन के ऊपर काम कर रहा है जैसे नेचर बेस्ड सोल्यूशन मैंने बताया पाकिस्तान के हवाले से तो दो बड़ी इंपॉर्टेंट चीज़ें टेक्नोलॉजी बेस्ड सोल्यूशन और नेचर बेस्ड सोल्यूशन टेक्नोलॉजी बेस में यही एनर्जी रिन्यूएबल एनर्जी और इलेक्ट्रिक व्हीकल्स और इसी की तरफ जा रहे हैं नेचर बेस्ड सॉल्यूशंस में ये सुनामी आ गया वाटर रिचार्ज आ गया या इस तरह की प्रोटेक्टेड एरिया इनिशिएटिव आ गया ये सारे इसी के हिस्से हैं तो ये काम हो रहा है आहिस्ता आहिस्ता इसका इम्पैक्ट आएगा हमने जब दो में ये रेड प्लस स्टार्ट किया उस वक्त लोग कह रहे थे रेड प्लस के पैसे आ रहे हैं दरख्त लगाने के हमें कब दे रहे लेकिन वो एक टाइम लगता है उस पर कितना टाइम लगा आज दो हज़ार इक्कीस साल गुजरने के बाद जाके पाकिस्तान ने स्ट्रेटी डिवेलप की प्रोविंस सेलेक्शन प्लान्स पर आ गया पायलटिंग की तरफ चला गया रेडी रेडीनेस से पायलटिंग की तरफ तो टाइम लगता है ट्रांजिशन पीरियड जो होता है उसको मैनेज करना बड़ा बड़ा इतना इजी नहीं है उसमें बहुत सारे रिस्क इन्वॉल्व होते हैं और उसके लिए कैपिटल इन्वेस्टमेंट चाहिए होती है तो हमें तो ये कैपिटल इन्वेस्टमेंट इसी सेक्टर का रेड प्लस का आठ साल में हमने ये चीज़ें अगर डिवेलप की हैं अब पायलटिंग की तरफ जा रहा है जब पायलटिंग अगले चार पाँच साल में उस पायलट प्रोजेक्ट से पता चलेगा कि हाँ जी ये टेस्ट हो गए सारे जो नेशनल लेवल थी स्ट्रेटीज बनी थी फॉरेस्ट मॉनिटरिंग सिस्टम बना सेफ गार्ड बना फ्रेल बना इसको टेस्ट किया पायलट साइड पे और उसके कुछ रिजल्ट सामने आ गए फिर उसकी नेशनल इम्प्लीमेंटेशन होती है तो टाइम लगता है उस पर थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया खामान साहब लास्टली मैं बस एक ही आपसे सवाल करूँगी फॉर द बेनिफिट ऑफ दटेंडेंस के मोस्टली स्टूडेंट्स अपनी ऑल ऑफ दर स्टूडेंट्स होते हैं यार से Uh, ये बताइए कि क्या इसकी पॉसिबिलिटी कितनी है कि हर सोशल सेक्टर की जो पॉलिसी है चाहे वो एजुकेशन की हो हेल्थ की हो साइंसेज में फाइनेंशियल पॉलिसीज हो साइंसेज में आईटी पॉलिसी वट एवर पॉलिसीज द गवर्नमेंट इज एक्चुअली दे हैव टू कम अप विद उसमें अगर ये नेट जीरो इकोनॉमी का कॉन्सेप्ट हाउ टू डू इट वेर आई मीन दिस इज basically awareness creation kind of a thing and uh, what is the government's uh, policy in it agar isko incorporate kar le in sub policies mein aapke khayal mein ye kis hat tak beneficial hoga madam ek to iski ek example main dunga ki jo new technologies aati hain inko public tak pahunchane ke liye awareness ke liye sabse aham role to definitely universities ka hai uh, universities ko 
मेरे मेरे हिसाब से क्योंकि मैं खुद भी एक स्टूडेंट लाइफ से गुजर के आया हूँ मैं अभी भी उसी प्रोग्रेस में हूँ तो यूनिवर्सिटीज़ में हम ये एक्सपेक्ट करते हैं मैं एज ए स्टूडेंट मैं कह सकता हूँ कि मैं ये एक्सपेक्ट करता हूँ किसी भी यूनिवर्सिटी से कि कोई भी अपडेटेड नॉलेज आता है और तो जाहिर बात है मैं ये नहीं कह सकता कि इलेक्ट्रिकल इंजीनियर वाला मुझे पढ़ाया या, या वो लेकिन एटलीस्ट जो इन्वायरमेंट के से रिलेटेड जो इकोनॉमी से रिलेटेड जो डिपार्टमेंट्स हैं वो एटलीस्ट अपने स्टूडेंट्स के अंदर ये शूर दे दें जो भी अपडेटेड नॉलेज नया आता है उन तक पहुँचाएँ और ये आपने बहुत ज़बरदस्त काम किया है जो ये वेबिनार इंट्रोड्यूस करा है तो ये वेबिनार जाहिर बात यही है तो हमारा रोल यूनिवर्सिटीज़ के ये मैंने आपको पहले भी कहा नेट जीरो कंपेन जो है उसमें अगर आप देखें मोर देन थाउजेंड यूनिवर्सिटीज़ हैं उसका हिस्सा हैं और वो क्या है वो वहाँ से उसी सीरीज ऑफ वेबिनार यही जो डॉक्यूमेंटेशन होती है उसको पब्लिक करते हैं दूसरा एक चीज़ जो पाकिस्तान ने किया है हमें अपने सेक्टर जाहिर बात मैं मोस्टली एग्जाम्पल्स अपने सेक्टर से ही दूंगा मुझे और सेक्टर्स का नहीं पता हमने एक कम्युनिकेशन स्ट्रेटजी 2016 में डेवलप की थी और उसको लिए हमने सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट पॉलिसी इंस्टीट्यूट के साथ हमने पार्टनरशिप की और उसके अंदर हमने बहुत सारे प्रोग्राम रखे उसमें जैसे पहले सवाल आया कि पॉलिसी जो गवर्नमेंट के जो पॉलिसी लेवल के लोग हैं उसमें एक इन्वायरमेंट ग्रुप भी है आपको ये भी मैं बताऊँ पार्लिमेंटेरियन का जिसमें मुशाहिद हुसैन सैद साहब जो हैं उस पार्लिमेंटेरियन इन्वायरमेंट के ऊपर जो ग्रुप है उसके चेयरपर्सन है और चेयरमैन है वो तो वो उन्होंने बल्कि एक बुक भी पब्लिश की थी पार्लियामेंटेरियंस की तरफ से ये बुक आई थी रेड प्लस के ऊपर वुड यू बिलीव कि वो एक, एक हमारा होता है क्योंकि हम इदारों को देखते हैं जिनका इन्फ्लुएंस पॉलिटिशियंस के ऊपर ज्यादा है तो एस का एक बहुत बड़ा इन्फ्लुएंस है तो हम उनके प्लेटफॉर्म को यूज करके हमने पॉलिटिशियंस के लिए वेबिनार्स भी अरेंज किए हमने सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट कॉन्फ्रेंस जो होती है उनकी एनुअल एस की उसके अंदर भी हमने पैनल डिस्कशन रखे रेड प्लस के ऊपर था कि दया दूसरा हमने यूनिवर्सिटीज के साथ कोलेबरेट किया मैं इसकी एक एग्जाम्पल दे दूं पंजाब यूनिवर्सिटी के अंदर ये अभी रेड प्लस जो है उनका एक ऑप्शनल सब्जेक्ट है करिकुलम का हिस्सा है अच्छा वो तो पहली यूनिवर्सिटी थी दूसरा जो एग्रीकल्चर यूनिवर्सिटी रावलपिंडी है उनका अंदर ये करिकुलम का हिस्सा बना है पाकिस्तान फॉरेस्ट इंस्टीट्यूट यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ पिशावर के अंदर रेड प्लस करिकुलम का हिस्सा बना है तो हमने एक कम्युनिकेशन स्ट्रेटेजी डिवेलप की उस कम्युनिकेशन स्ट्रेटेजी को पहले एस ने कम्प्लीट किया पहले फेज को दूसरे फेज को अभी इंप्लीमेंट कर रहा है आई और आई के अंदर भी उन्हीं एक्टिविटीज़ को मजीद हमने ब्रॉडन किया है और और स्ट्रेंदन किया है और फंडिंग उसके अंदर डाली है ताकि ये कॉन्सेप्ट जो है वो पॉलिटिशियंस तक भी जाएं यूनिवर्सिटी स्टूडेंट्स तक भी जाएं आम पब्लिक तक भी जाएँ रिलीजियस लीडर्स तक भी जाएँ उसमें डिफरेंट अप्रोचेज हैं रेडियो प्रोग्राम्स हैं टेलीविजन है फार्मर ग्रुप्स के साथ इंटरव्यूज़ हैं उनके सेशनस हैं पॉलिटिशन्स के लिए अलग सेशनस हैं ड्रामे हैं मीडिया टॉक्स हैं बहुत सारे हैं तो हम डिफरेंट प्लेटफॉर्म्स को यूज करके इस कम्युनिकेशन स्ट्रेटजी को आके लेके जाते हैं लेकिन जो मोस्ट इम्पोर्टेंट चीज़ है यूनिवर्सिटीज़ का अहम जो रोल है इस अवेयरनेस को फैलाने में वो ये है कि आप ये एक इम्पोर्टेंट जो प्लेटफॉर्म हैं मसन एक मैं आपको बता सकता हूँ गुपीस के नाम से है ग्लोबल यूनिवर्सिटी पार्टनरशिप कुछ इस तरीके से है जो कि यू एन यू एन इन्वायरमेंट प्रोग्राम चला रहा है गुपीस आप अगर देख लें उसमें मैंने एक दफ़ा चाइना में पार्टिसिपेट किया था एक कॉन्फ्रेंस में तो वहाँ पे मुझे पता चला कि ये यूनिवर्सिटीज़ के एक ग्लोबल लेवल पे एक पूरा एक कंसोशियम है जो ये इन्वायरमेंटल कॉन्सेप्ट को लेके डिफरेंट जगहों पे डिफरेंट यूनिवर्सिटीज पे कॉन्फ्रेंसेस कराते हैं और वो बाकायदा अपने करिकुलम्स को यूनिवर्सिटी लेवल पे अपडेट करते रहते हैं न्यू इंफॉर्मेशन को तो इसी तरह ये नेट जीरो कैंपेन है अब इसको आपने कैसे जाके इसमें पार्टिसिपेट करना है जारी बात है आप मेरा काम था रेफरेंस देना रेफरेंस मैंने प्रोवाइड किया और ये क्या चीज़ें बता रही है उसमें क्या कंसोशियम है किस किस ने ज्वाइन किया है अब इस कंपेन को आप कैसे ज्वाइन कर सकते हैं ये यूनिवर्सिटीज़ को चाहिए ज्वाइन करें इस कंपेन का फ़ायदा उठा बहुत सारे ऐसे कंपेन होते हैं वर्ल्ड लेवल पे जो ये अवेयरनेस का काम करते हैं मेरे ख्याल से ये बहुत बड़ी अपॉर्चुनिटी है इनको ज्वाइन करना चाहिए बेशक बिल्कुल सही कहा आपने थैंक यू सो मच क्योंकि आई थिंक वी हैव रन आउट ऑफ टाइम आई मीन इट्स वेरी लेट नाउ आपका बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया वन सगेन कामरान हुसैन साहब आप हमारे साथ हैं आप यहाँ यूके में हैं आपने वेबिनार जो है यहाँ यूके से बैठ के किया है पार्टिसिपेट आप जब यहाँ तशरीफ लाएँ पाकिस्तान वन एवर यू आर इन पाकिस्तान प्लीज़ विजिट आर इंस्टीट्यूट अप्लाइड इकनॉमिक रिसर्च सेंटर इंस्टीट्यूट बाई द नेम ऑफ ए आर सी अपलाइड इकोनॉमिक रिसर्च इंस्टीट्यूट मैडम आपके आप पार्टिसिपेंट्स के लिए स्टूडेंट्स अगर आप ज्वाइन करें मैं एक अपडेट देता चलूँ मैं चूँकि खुद ट्रेनर भी हूँ कुछ इंटरनेशनल ट्रेनिंग्स का
एक कार्बन फॉरेस्ट्री का कोर्स आता है यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ फ्राइबर्ग में मैं खुद उसका ट्रेनर भी हूँ एक एशियन इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी बैंकॉक में आता है जिसमें अकाउंटिंग फॉर कार्बन एमिशन एंड रिमूव थ्रू रेड प्लस एक्टिविटीज यानी फॉरेस्ट्री से रिलेटेड अगर वो अनाउंस जब होंगे मैं आपके साथ भी शेयर करूंगा आपके स्टूडेंट्स के साथ आप शेयर कीजिएगा कोई भी पार्टिसिपेट करना चाहता है मुझे जरूर बताएं इन मैं जहां तक हो सका फंडिंग अवेलेबल हुई तो हम जरूर एक दो को उसमें जरूर करेंगे थैंक यू सो मच बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया आपने बहुत अच्छी इन्फॉर्मेशन दी है आप जरूर हमारे साथ शेयर करें ये सारे कोर्सेज हमारे स्टूडेंट जो है वो बहुत इंटरेस्टेड है और हमारे स्टूडेंट जो देव लॉट ऑफ पोटेंशियल एक्चुअली टू डू वर्क इन दिस एरिया and they are very keen very inter- i mean they are really uh, they just need some opportunities aur madam ek aur research research site jiske pakistan ki bahut zarurat hai agar is pe kaam kara sake main waise aap se share karta hu sare participants bhi hain hamare is waqt jo pakistan mein jo ek bahut global level pe ek bahut badi debate hai bahut kam research hai is pe hame ye study ek comparative analysis zarur karaye economic benefits ki ke agar wood based economy aur carbon based economy ke ek comparative study bahut zaruri hai iski misal main aapko deta hu commercial forestry hai kp mein hai gilgit baltistan mein hai jahan pe ek private forest hai commercial forest hai wahan pe lease hi aata hai jungle kaat ke le jata hai wo one time benefit leta hai lekin jo environmental destruction hai wo long term rehti hai uske muqable mein agar wahi cheez jo hai वो कार्बन बेस्ड इकोनॉमी हो तो जंगल भी खड़ा रहेगा और उसके क्या बेनिफिट्स हो सकते हैं सोसाइटी के ऊपर तो वो एक कंपैरेटिव एनालिसिस हो ये एक ग्लोबल डिबेट बन चुकी है और इसका अभी तक कोई एज सच कोई इफेक्टिव रिसर्च स्टडी सामने नहीं आई है तो इस पर मेरे ख्याल से कुछ स्टूडेंट्स को अगर आप इंगेज करें उसकी एक एग्जाम्पल मैं आपको दे सकता हूँ आप गिलगित बल्तिस्तान भेजें और उनसे कहें कि वहाँ के जो वर्किंग प्लान हैं उनको उठाएं उनके वॉल्यूम टेबल सारा कुछ दिया हुआ है उनको कन्वर्ट करें कार्बन के अंदर और कार्बन के मोनिटरी बेनिफिट्स जो करंट रेट है उसको लगा के वो देख सकते हैं कि आया इसमें जो वुड बेस है उससे इतना वॉल्यूम निकलता है इतना रॉयल्टी मिलती है इतना उसका फाइन भरते हैं तो ये तो वन टाइम बेनिफिट आ गया वो खा गए खामोश रहे लेकिन जो कार्बन का है वो ओवर द ईयर्स रिमूवल जो है वो उसको इकोनॉमी इकोनॉमिक सपोर्ट देता रहेगा ये एक स्टडी है जो हो सकती है ओके थैंक यू सो मच ये बिल्कुल ये मैं इन अपने स्टूडेंट्स के साथ ही डिस्कस करूँगी क्योंकि इनका इंटरेस्ट है इस एरिया में बहुत और फिर ये काम भी हमें करना चाहिए ये स्टडी के ऊपर जो है आई होप दैट सम ऑफ आर फैकल्टी मेंबर्स और स्टूडेंट्स दे वुड बी विलिंग टू वर्क ऑन इट सो मेरा ये ख्याल है कि बिल्कुल ये काम हो सकता है और हम करेंगे आप इंफॉर्मेशन हमसे शेयर करें और ई भी करते हैं तो उससे ये होगा कि ई के थ्रू जो है ज़रा डिटेल इन्फॉर्मेशन हमारे पास आ जाएगी आपके पास से और हम भी फिर ईमेल के थ्रू ही आपसे शेयर कर लेंगे तो आपकी यहाँ पे मौजूदगी का बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया अनिल सलमान साहब डॉक्टर अनिल सलमान और डॉक्टर मोहम्मद रफ़ी साहब और वो मेरे ख्याल इस वक्त तो जा चुके हैं उनका भी बहुत ज़्यादा शुक्रिया क्योंकि उन्होंने काफ़ी देर उनकी प्रेजेंटेशन जो हैं बड़ी इन्फॉर्मेटिव थी और आपकी भी बहुत ज़्यादा इन्फॉर्मेटिव है और आपने बड़े डिटेल आंसर्स दिए हैं जिससे बहुत कुछ सुनने का समझने का मौका मिला है थैंक यू सो मच वंस अगेन एंड आई होप टू सी यू अगेन थैंक यू मैडम